I'm in a logic free zone. I'm I open to counterintuitive ideas. ideas. I believe that tiny little ideas can have huge effects. I will dare to be trivial. I will forgive any Wi Fi dropouts. I will put my out of office on. I will tell everyone I've been to the world's greatest festival of behavioural science and creativity. I'll remember to use hashtag NudgeStop2020. And I understand that if I don't enjoy the day, I'm entitled to a full refund. And now let's count down together to start the festival. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Back to hours five to eight of today's Marathon Nudstock Festival broadcast. I'm delighted to tell you that in this section we have some incredible speakers as well. We have world famous behavioural economist Dan Ariely here to talk to us about how he's been helping in the global pandemic we're in right now. We also have psychologist and comedian Professor Peter McGraw here to talk to us about his humour research lab. And also, controversially, we have Patrick Fagan, who is the ex-lead psychologist of Cambridge Analytica before it closed down in 2018 to talk to us about his... I'm delighted to say I'm going to introduce the man that needs no introduction whatsoever. He's a key proponent of the exploding behavioural science movement around the world right now. He's inspired millions through his TED Talks and through his latest book, Alchemy, which you can also get on audiobook where he reads it himself. He has this incredible knack of turning the impossibly complicated into the delightfully simple. I'm delighted to welcome onto the Nudgestock stage our founder of the behavioural science practice, Mr. Rory Sutherland. So there's a saying in English that uh, it's an ill wind that blows no man good. And with the natural marketers insane over optimism, I can see a few positive things emerging from this crisis. Uh, for one thing, by being forced to make this event virtual and global, we now have an audience which is an order of magnitude or more larger than we ever could have hosted in a physical location. I'll be updating you with audience figures uh, during the day, but we have an audience which is no longer confined to those people who can make it to Margate on a particular date, and that's fantastic. The other thing which I think I'm optimistic about is that suddenly every business question has become a behavioural question. Not quite. It's become a technology or medical question or a behavioural question, to be precise. But the importance of marketing and marketing thinking and behavioural thinking has, whether we like it or not, suddenly been rocketed up the decision tree considerably. Because whereas... Most of the time, I think, what business did was it treated income revenue as a kind of given. It was one line on the balance sheet. And attention was paid to the rest of the balance sheet in about that ratio of six cost lines to one revenue line. And revenue was treated as a bit of a given, and therefore efficiency was treated as a proxy for effectiveness. In other words, most business attention was devoted towards questions of cost saving and efficiency. That's going to change. First of all, there's going to be far more attention to questions of resilience. Secondly, there's going to be far more attention to questions of psychology. In other words, the question is not how can we operate most efficient flights, it's how can we get people onto planes. And so, whether you like it or not, and I hope we don't lack the big match temperament, we're probably all going to have to step up to the plate a bit more than we did in the past. And I think there's something really important here, because I would argue that for lots and lots of behavioural and biased reasons, there's this extraordinary reason, why, extraordinary tendency in business to denigrate or downplay psychological explanations for things. And what I think will come out of this crisis is a little bit of a necessary corrective. I've just got a little, I learned this from Robert H. Frank, the, the thought experiment. 
Robert Frank has wonderful thought experiments which he gives to his economics pupils, including one which I'll ask you to Google the answers if you don't mind, which is why is it that when people get married, a wedding dress which is only worn once is bought, whereas tuxedos are rented? Now, tuxedos can be worn many, many times and not only to weddings. Whereas I think it's fair to say that you only wear a wedding dress once. Certainly if you turned up at someone else's wedding in your own wedding dress, that would be eyed slightly askance. I think that would be something of a gaffe, probably fair, okay? And so in, in the tradition of those Robert Frank questions, I'm gonna ask you a question. And the question is, why are there more fish restaurants by the sea? And many of you, particularly if you're a business person, will be going, this guy's a complete idiot. Well, it's obvious that you're close to the point of supply. Okay. You know, that there are lots of fish very nearby in the sea. Therefore, your distribution costs, your logistic costs are lower. You know, you have a regular supply of fresh fish. And uh, why would that not, why, what possible other explanation could there be? And you think about it a bit more and go, well, if that were really true, there'd be lots of fish restaurants five miles inland, but there aren't really. It's the seaside itself which sees the profusion of fish restaurants. And secondly, probably the cheapest place to buy regularly, to buy fresh fish, is going to be Billingsgate Market in London. Okay, It's not going to be buying from one or two boats that happen to come in with you know, a fairly occasional catch. I think there's another explanation. I think it's a completely different explanation, which is psychological, which is that fish tastes a lot better when you're by the sea. And I think taking it further, there's a complexity explanation, which is that, and I think Nassim Taleb quotes me in his book about this, it's very difficult to open a fish restaurant successfully because out of any party of six people, there's always one person who doesn't feel like eating fish. So getting a kind of consensus, once you understand that minority rule, getting a consensus of people together under normal circumstances who all want to eat fish is quite difficult. But when you've all gone to the seaside together, that's slightly different. Now you've created a moment and a mood where people really feel like eating fish simultaneously. So my friend um, Jag Bala has a wonderful phrase, which is he calls rigorous but wrong. It's perfectly possible within business to come up with a wonderfully rational expression economic explanation for something which satisfies your need to look rational and look business-like while at the same time not getting close to what my colleague Chris Graves calls the real why, the real deep explanation. And the real why for consumer behavior is generally much more psychological than business people like to think. They don't like to think it because of that bias I mentioned earlier, which is people like reductionism. They like worlds where there's a single mental framework you have to use, which provides you with a single optimally right answer. By contrast, behavioral science is highly messy. It's unpredictable, it's uncertain. It's not a science like physics. It's debatable whether you call it a science at all, unless you use the more accurate uh, use of the word science to mean a field of reasonable inquiry. Now, what I think is important here is that once you understand the real why, suddenly you've now got something you can build on. So maybe it tells you that if you open a fish restaurant, uh, it's not a bad idea to create noises or a backdrop or smells which are conducive to the consumption of fish and that that will have a major effect. By the way, this isn't just a freak bit of psychophysics I'm talking about. Rosé wine tastes better by the sea, just as Guinness tastes better in Ireland, even though it's chemically identical. And just as Perno tastes delicious in France, but tastes like piss if you bring a bottle home, okay? These, these contextual um, effects on our epistemology are all over the place. And so maybe it teaches you how you could open a fish restaurant somewhere else and be a bit more successful. Or maybe it tells you the fact that when Greek restaurants put up a stonking great picture of the Acropolis um, behind you, maybe they know something that, you, that had never occurred to you before, which is that Greek food tastes a bit better if you create the atmosphere and the architecture of being in Greece. You know, the mandatory arch in the middle of the restaurant, for example. You know, maybe certain foods taste, taste better in the open air, certain foods taste better indoors. And I would argue that the last remaining untapped, unmined potential for really significant competitive advantage in any business that is enduring 
is in first understanding what is the real why the real truth of why it is people do things and that means not really just being customer centric it means being kind of amygdala centric in other words you have to focus yourself not just around those parts of your customer's brain which do the talking and which are generally engaged busily in post rationalization you have to be equally centered around those parts of your customer's brain which can't talk and which are opaque to introspection you know the parts of the brain that influence our behavior without having any effect on our reasoning and here i come to i think an interesting point which is i think one of the things we can do here if we're really brave i think we need to take this opportunity to reframe capitalism now this is not just me talking it's people like for example jonathan haidt talking as well which is that the standard idea of capitalism is that through competition it serves to deliver things uh, very very efficiently to people things that people already know they want and things which they already know they're how much they're prepared to pay for okay and i think a much more interesting way to look at free markets is to say it isn't really that much about efficiency at all actually what free markets are is they're a massive extraordinarily well funded psychological social experiment and the aim of this experiment is to find out what people really want and under what circumstances people want certain things and i think if you view business as a form of scientific inquiry into what people really want and it's not necessarily uh, particularly close to what you might think of as the official logical purpose of a product uh, nasim's written um stuff we used to talk about which is the real value of a dishwasher isn't necessarily that it washes your plates uh, it's that it provides you with a place to put dirty plates where they're out of sight and where you can't smell them okay the real value of a swimming pool uh, isn't really that you swim in it it's that it gives you a license to walk around your garden in a bathing costume without feeling like a dickhead okay that quite often even products or services which seem to have a very very clear function aren't really about that at all i've been exploring electric cars and i've decided that actually um with cars um a large function of the car is really there to give blokes something to talk about to each other which doesn't involve emotions uh, and so i think tesla's doing a great job here they're adding a whole bunch of carno theory gizmos like fart mode and dog mode and it will enable people to go well actually what you really need is the new supercharger they've just opened on the b459 which is a kind of comfortable range of male conversation which doesn't touch on anything you know deep or human and so once you understand what things are really for business becomes more complicated it becomes messy it becomes less certain but one it becomes a place where you can more easily find sustainable sources of profit by simply knowing things that your competitors don't or to misquote heineken appealing to parts of the brain that your competitors don't but also when you view it as something and this is something drayton bird said to me years ago when i first started in the business you don't do marketing to make money first and foremost you do it to learn and here i think we can actually start to see if we start to view consumer capitalism as an immensely absurdly well funded social science experiment we start to see actually a more interesting um way to look at business it's not the sort of dreary kind of exploitation of what we already know which is a necessary part of business i'm not disputing that but a large part of it is actually the experimental discovery of valuable things that we might not yet know and that's where i think there's an interesting divide between business as a problem solving um entity and academia as a problem solving entity and so i think this brings me i think when i mentioned business as being a source of in, a form of inquiry alongside the sciences it brings me to what i think is the central function of nudge doc which is to be a place or in this case a space where business and academia can learn from each other profitably and by the way i'm not letting business off the hook here 
if you think about it, I think Amos Tversky said that um, what Daniel and I do is we take the things which are already known by uh, car salesmen and advertising executives and we codify them into a kind of recognizable framework. And I think our failure, by the way, not only as marketers, but as business people, to attempt to codify and look for common patterns uh, in uh, human behavior was, when you think about it, an extraordinary kind of act of omission, okay? On the other hand, there are advantages to business as a problem-solving tool over academia. One, we're not necessarily trying to be right, we're trying to be progressively less wrong. Two, we have a very good incentive scheme. If you discover something that other people don't believe, but which is nonetheless true, for instance, uh, you get handsomely rewarded. Uh, business is probably the only um, sphere of human activity where it actually pays you literally to change your mind. It's a very, very good mechanism for overcoming confirmation bias, because it doesn't matter how much you've invested in um, basically uh, a particular wrong course of action. If you make more money doing something else, you are literally paid to change your mind. And it's also a facet of business, I think, which is it's very good at coming up with answers to questions where there's more than one right answer. Different people at different moments in different contexts want different things. There isn't, it isn't an optimization problem. There isn't a single right answer to things. Uh, there are all sorts of alternatives and substitution effects going on. And so I think um, if we actually look at business as a form of information economics, I think it becomes much more interesting and its uh, singular virtues become uh, more apparent than if we endlessly consider it simply through the lens of finance and numbers. And so this is the great point I'd like to make, which is this is a wonderful way of business and academia stealing from each other. I'll put it as bluntly as that. In other words, understanding what it is that the other thing does well and learning from that. And, you know, the, uh, there's a wonderful thing which I think is very useful in this. I, you know, I would criticize science sometimes, possibly even the scientific response to the virus crisis, in trying to build models from data that existed, rather than asking the question of, actually, before we do this, what do we really need to know? And I'd also criticize business for doing that. The data obsessives tend to believe that once you have enough data, therefore you know everything. But actually, you can have huge amounts of data and still be largely ignorant of the questions you really need to answer, like why the hell are people doing this, for example. And I think, you know, that's another interesting tendency. There's a wonderful data analyst at Google who, whose Twitter handle is actually Quaesita, Q-U-A-E-S-I-T-A. And her point is that a datum or data are things you are given, quaesita, she's obviously a bit of a classicist, are things that you seek. And the assumption that the data will always, simply because you happen to be given them, will reveal your quaesita is not necessarily a safe assumption. So there are all sorts of questions about knowledge, science, progress, where I think the two disciplines can learn fantastically from one another. And I'll end on this with just something that's been obsessing me and to the point where my colleagues are thoroughly bored with me but it is the fact that and i have to confess something really horrible here i met the marketing director of zoom um about six to eight months ago and uh, it, one of the things that's fascinated me for years is why we've been so slow and reluctant to adopt video conferencing and one of my sort of parting sentences was, of course, what you really need is a mass transit strike or a minor pandemic, and that will get video conferencing off the ground. But here we see, I think, one of the behaviours that probably won't revert to the status quo ante after this crisis will be travel and meeting and communication and connection behaviour. And I think here you have a really, really interesting exercise in what on earth is going on. Why is it that something, I mean, I was a video conferencing advocate, and I don't take any credit for that because it struck me as blindingly obvious that this was a highly significant technology. You had this yawning gap between 
asynchronous textual forms of communication like email on the one hand and getting on a plane at a cost of two thousand pounds at the other hand it was fairly clear there was a map between those two forms a gap between those two forms of interaction and yet nobody seemed to have any kind of urge to step into the gap and fill that gap by using the technology all the more bizarre since I'd grown up in the 1960s and 70s when video calling along with flying cars was one of the things we were most looking forward to. And I think there, what's fabulous about that is it shows that there's no innovation without marketing or to put it another way, marketing and innovation are in many ways two sides of exactly the same coin. Peter Drucker believed that in many ways. That if you think about it, an invention, if it isn't adopted, if it doesn't change behavior, remains largely of theoretical interest. It's only when you get widespread human adoption that something makes the leap from invention to innovation. And in many cases, the barrier to achievement, sometimes they're technological, okay? People had kind of sussed out powered flight a long time before the Wright brothers, but nobody could get an engine light enough. With steam power, it was simply impossible, okay? And so there were people who grasped that sort of thing long beforehand, but it was the power source that was required, okay? But in other cases, you have the technology there and it's already quite good and no one's adopting it. Because you've created the technological solution, but you haven't created the conditions or context in which it becomes attractive to adopt it. And in many ways, okay, I look at marketing as being the, uh, the kind of Janus-faced alternative innovation. Everything is a mixture of working out what people want and finding a clever way to deliver it and working out what you can deliver and finding a clever way to make people want it. And so I always viewed this video conferencing conundrum as kind of the Fermat's last theorem of behavioral science. It was the thing I always wanted to crack. And until this happened, maybe I was getting halfway there. One of the things I discovered, for example, is what you can never do and must never do is say to your staff, by the way, you're free to work from home. If you say that, it's basically a concession. And they feel they're burning reputational capital every time they take advantage of it. OK. On the other hand, if you say, no, 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 you don't understand me. It's not that you're free to work from home. I want you to work from home. It's only then that you'll get some sort of behavioral shift. And I think insights like this have a bearing on everything, okay? Now, I've talked mostly about business. What I haven't talked about is charitable and pro-social work, which is, if you like, uh, the third apex of the triangle here, which is we can learn from both academia and business and deploy that kind of learning uh, in things which are socially beneficial. And video conferencing fascinated me because I saw it as a proxy for lots of other problems, from the adoption of electric cars to the widespread adoption of solar panels. Maybe there's still a role for government, maybe there's still a role for conventional economics. You need financial incentives, you need legislation. What's patently clear is that maybe the most difficult sale of all is the first solar panel on the street. Once there's one solar panel up there, the second sale becomes easier and the third, fourth and fifth sales almost become a breeze which has really important implications for advertising because it may mean that your advertising is in fact most effective when it appears to be, in terms of cost per sale, most costly. Which I suppose brings me round in a full loop to the fact that the huge value of this is that when we discover things that are counterintuitive, they're hugely valuable. A, because your competitors don't know them, but B, because even sometimes if your competitors don't know them, they're culturally incapable of copying them because they're so wedded to a logical financial model of the world that they're incapable of seeing it through a different lens. So, so what I've done here has been hugely overambitious in attempting people to look at the business world, not through the financial lens, not exclusively through the lens of technology and innovation, but also through a psychological lens. I'm not claiming that's the right way to look at the world. There isn't a right way to look at the world. I'm simply saying it's a complementary way to look at the world, which will go a long way to explain why Nespresso, Amazon Prime, Uber, Dyson, Red Bull, and a load of totally bonkers businesses which no rational person would have started in the first place are so ingenious when, to a financial mind, they look comparatively insane. Okay? Now, if during Nudge Stock, just 
four or five times during the next eight hours and during the previous four, we've just encouraged you to look at the world a little bit differently, to think that maybe fish restaurants are by the sea because fish taste better by the sea, rather than looking for the standard off-the-shelf logistical explanation or economic explanation. Then Nudge Doc's doing its job. That's the great news, because as Alan Kay once said, a change in perspective is worth 40 IQ points. There are some things you cannot see that cannot make sense unless you're willing to change the way you look at that. And if that just happens several times during this day, then I can happily say Nudge Stock's been a great success. So now I'm pleased to introduce Patrick Fagan, who's essentially uh, in recovery from Cambridge Analytica. Um, I think this will be an absolutely fascinating conversation because there are two strands to, I think, what we do, which is what you might call Dan Ariely strand, which is predictably irrational, which is what makes people consistently the same. In other words, certain mental patterns that are common to all of us most of the time. And then there's the other strand, which is what makes people different. And as a perfect person to launch that second question of where are people different? Here's Patrick. Thank you very much. So, hi. Yes, I did used to be lead psychologist at Cambridge Analytica. Um, the great thing about virtual conferencing, of course, is that I can't hear you booing, which makes a nice change. Um, and shortly after the scandal, uh, companies used to consult me for the day. I think basically they just wanted to pay me to ask me questions about it, uh, which I'm fine with, by the way. And I'm on LinkedIn if you want to do that. Um, but one of these companies, they sold uh, Viagra, Cialis, things like that through, through a website because uh, it just became legal in the UK. And I was working in the office and I would hear these uh, dings, these notifications on someone's computer. And every time someone bought a product, um, they received a notification. And after one of these dings, the person at the computer um, announced to the office, oh, uh, John Smith is buying some more pills again. Something for the weekend, John. And everyone laughed and gathered around the computer um, and they pulled up John's Facebook profile and had a look through his pictures. Uh, and someone said, wow, is that his wife? I'm not surprised he needs these pills. Um, so the point I'm making is that nothing really is private anymore. And uh, you may be, I'm sure you're aware that if you buy something or visit a website that's tracked and recorded, but you may not be aware just uh, what can be inferred or predicted from that data. So let me give you a worked example based on academic research and also some uh, private commercial research I've done. So let's say you have someone who is into celebrity and lifestyle interests. Uh, we can predict uh, that they will have a personality that is more um, open to experience, uh, more disorganized and more extroverted. And then so from these uh, interests, this digital footprint, we can predict that this person uh, is more likely to be unfaithful, to cheat on their partner. So we have that behavior we can predict. But we can also understand what type of messaging they best respond to. So this personality type prefers messaging which is more disorganized and messy, more stimulating. They are more likely to respond well to scarcity appeals. And they're more likely to look up to the magician archetype. So the kind of uh, transformative keeper of secrets like Frank Underwood from House of Cards. So, you know, if somebody likes celebrity and lifestyle things, they have that affinity through the websites they visit, for example then you might serve them uh, websites for infidelity, uh, adverts for infidelity websites, like Ashley Madison. Now, Ashley Madison here, uh, they have life is short, so they're touching into scarcity appeal. Um, they have the uh, keeper of secrets archetype there, but I think the aesthetics is missing a trick. For this personality type, they would respond better to messier, more creative, more outgoing uh, aesthetics like Tinder use. So you probably recognize all this as kind of a black box approach. You take data and build predictive models from it. Um, but you may not know that black boxes have actually been uh, worshipped um, for, for millennia, in fact, going back to ancient Romans, perhaps earlier. Um, and yes, there is this otherworldly intelligence aspect to them, but they're also uh, known to kind of influence and persuade. So in 2001, for example, the uh, monoliths put certain images and ideas in the primate's head, and that causes a step change of evolution in the book where the uh, primates then become aware that they can uh, use tools. So the monolith put images in their head which changed what they viewed as acceptable and possible and changed their behavior. Today, uh, we all have our own black monoliths in our pockets, uh, which likewise put certain images and ideas in our head and change what we believe to be possible and acceptable and influence behavior on a mass scale. 
And from a research point of view, then what we can do is use research to measure and capture these more kind of ethereal um, associations, motivations, semiotics, sort of personality traits and so on, and actually turn them into concrete usable uh, data points, put them into these uh, so-called black boxes for predictive modeling, and then send the right messages to the right people through the, uh, the so-called monoliths that they have, their, their laptops, their TV screens, their, their smartphones and so on, for mass influence. Now, there's uh, many, many examples of how symbols can be used to influence people on a mass scale. Just for example, um, how do you get people to buy twice as many Alka-Seltzer? Well, for example, uh, you put two fizzing tablets on the front of the packaging, and that uh, nudges people into thinking you need to use two when you actually only need to use one. A tongue-in-cheek example, how do you increase the value perceptions of uh, shreddies? Well, say they're diamonds, not squares. Or how do you get housewives in the 1950s to buy a cake mix, a ready-made cake mix when they feel like that's cheating and they're not really uh, giving to their family when they use it? Well, you change the recipe so that you're required to crack two eggs into it. And then the eggs are kind of a feminine motherly symbol that make the consumers feel as though they're giving of their feminine motherliness when they make the product and serve it to their family. Uh, from my own back catalogue at Capuchin, we have a, a client who wanted the brand to be perceived as more rugged and more able to withstand damage and stress. Well, how do you communicate that? From research, we found the best thing to do was counterintuitively to damage the product a little bit. Because if you think of a pirate with a peg leg, a hook hand, and an eye patch, uh, you need a little bit of damage to communicate that you can withstand it. So then the next step is taking these kind of um, ethereal, kind of fuzzy semiotics and turning them into real data points and linking them to specific people and groups. So for example, with some research I did, uh, I found that conservatives are more likely to symbolically identify with the sun, whereas liberals are more likely to symbolically identify with the moon, which makes sense from a kind of esoteric point of view. Similarly, uh, with other research, I found that people who are open to experience uh, are more likely to look up to the wise sage, for example, Yoda as an archetype, whereas conscientious people are more likely to look up to the persistent hero like Superman. And you can see how this could be used for uh, targeted messaging. Uh, but bringing it back to Earth a bit, you can also customize uh, heuristics, nudges to different groups as well. For example, agreeable people are more likely to be influenced by a social proof nudge, as you'd probably expect. And this is all because we have these underlying dispositions, usually neurobiological in nature, which predict consistent patterns of behavior across different domains and in different contexts. So as a worked example, uh, extroversion is largely to do with uh, more mass in the region of the brain that processes reward, making extroverts more, more reward sensitive. And as a result, they're more optimistic, more active, more outgoing, um, and that results in certain predictable behaviors. So in the short term, if you see somebody, and this is all based on academic research, if you see somebody who's wearing faded shoes, wearing a t-shirt with a pop music band on it, and is smiling a lot, you can infer that that person is probably an extrovert. Uh, extroverts are active, so they have faded shoes, they're happy, so they smile, they like sensations, so they listen to rhythmic music. So you can infer he's an extrovert, then you can use that inference to predict his behavior in other contexts. Uh, for example, he would probably be good at sales. Uh, which talks to a principle in psychology known as thin slices. So if I was to give you a very thin slice of cake, you could look at it and tell me quite accurately what the rest of the cake looks like without having to see it. In the same way, if you see a thin slice of someone's behavior, you can tell quite accurately what their behavior is like the rest of the time. Um, a famous example of this, a counselor videotaped newlyweds talking for 15 minutes and coded it for various behaviors like defensiveness, criticism. He was able to predict whether or not they get divorced uh, to an accuracy of 83%. So that very small, thin slice of behavior could predict something quite monumental and quite far in the future. Another one um, is that the shape of your face uh, is linked to your personality. So for example, baby-faced people tend to be more agreeable. Uh, people tend to balk at this. Nobody likes to think that you can judge a book by its cover, but unfortunately you can. Uh, there's a fair amount of evidence on this. Here's just 10 papers as an example, but there's many more showing that face shape and structure is linked to personality traits. 
Um, and then uh, moving into the digital world, you can use someone's digital footprint to infer personality traits. So here's an example uh, from some work I did previously. Um, if somebody uses Audible, the app, they're also more likely to use Deliveroo and Etsy. So they, they, those apps cluster together and you can infer that that's probably uh, openness to new things. Uh, if somebody uses LinkedIn, they'll also use uh, Evernote and the Sunday Times app, and that's probably being organized and hardworking. If somebody uses Tinder, they're also more likely to use WebMD, um, and I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions on that one. <clears throat> Um, and these uh, data points are fairly accurate as well. So people like about 230 things on Facebook on average. If this algorithm has that many likes on you, it can predict your personality uh, more accurately than can a family member, um, a friend, a roommate, or a work colleague. The only person who knows you better is your spouse. However, if the algorithm has 300 or more likes, then it becomes more accurate than even your spouse. And as I said, the next step then is once you infer someone's personality, you can predict all sorts of things about them. So this study found, for example, if somebody doesn't like bitter food, so for example, gin, tonic, gin and tonic, uh, dark chocolate, or God forbid, gin and tonic flavored dark chocolate, uh, if somebody dislikes those things, they're more likely to be agreeable. And then other research has found that if somebody is agreeable, they're more likely to say yes to an orgy. Uh, I guess they'll just agree to anything. But now you know, so you can offer your friends some dark chocolate and based on their response, you know what they get up to at the weekend. So you're welcome for that. Uh, more practically, you can use these insights to target different messaging. Uh, so aesthetics is one example. Uh, conscientious people like representational, does what it says on the tin structure kind of art, like portraits and landscapes. Extroverts like art, which is kind of diverse and stimulating, <clears throat> and so on. And the same is true, for example, of language. Uh, disagreeable people, as one example, prefer emojis like the shark, the meh face, and uh, the devil. And I think the government could have potentially use this approach with their COVID messaging recently. So, of course, they said, stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. Now, that's a very, as you would expect, conservative message. It's a prevention-focused message. It's about preventing losses and maintaining the status quo. So stay, protect, and save. However, that only really resonates with about half of the electorate. The other half are more promotion-focused. And so for them, a targeted message, which was more like, enjoy being at home, help the NHS, and win the war, may have been more resonant and more effective. And then finally, just to make the point that this does work, that here, for example, is academic uh, peer-reviewed study showing that personality targeted Facebook ads have a significantly higher conversion rate. So you can do it, it does work, uh, but should you? Well, that's another question entirely. And I thought this Jurassic Park quote was quite apt because uh, in Jurassic Park, they try and keep the dinosaurs kept up in those cages, but of course they couldn't uh, and life found a way. In the same way, this use of data science and behavioral science uh, is here now. It's out of the bag. You can't really put it back any more than the Amish could roll back the use of electricity. Um, so it's here to stay. Um, and on that point, not only is it here to stay, but everyone is using it. So in the, my first week at Cambridge Analytica, I overheard a colleague saying to someone else, Cambridge Analytica is like a strip club. Everyone wants to go, but no one wants to be seen there. Um, and it's true, everyone wants to do this, you know, don't want to be public about it, but everyone is doing it. Uh, since Cambridge Analytica, it's just become more prolific and more effective. Um, and many of you, I'm sure, work in advertising and you know this to be true. Um, and similarly, everyone is doing it. And when it comes to ethics, it appears to be, it's not really the usage of this as a tool so much as who is using it that defines whether people find it to be ethical or not. So Cambridge Analytica story was, of course, broken by The Guardian. Um, in 2012, the Obama campaign did more or less the same thing. They harvested people's Facebook likes to send targeted messaging on Facebook. Um, and The Guardian wrote about that at the time, and they said it was extraordinary. They said it used top data wonks, and it was a powerhouse campaign. So you can see it's not really about using this as a tool, more is about who is using it. As a godfather of propaganda, um, Edward Bernays, and incidentally, direct blood relative of the CEO of Netflix, uh, said, the only difference between propaganda and education is in the point of view. 
The advocacy of what we believe in is education. The advocacy of what we don't is propaganda. And then the second point I want to make with respect to ethics is that targeted advertising is probably not really any worse for society than traditional advertising. There was a recent study which found that uh, advertising, uh, data to suggest that advertising can dis decrease life satisfaction. Uh, and why wouldn't it? Because part of what advertising does is to induce some kind of tension and dissatisfaction in you so that you'll go out and buy a product. Uh, passion is the steam in the engine that drives behavior and adverts want to arouse those passions so that you'll go out and, and buy it. Um, a great example is this recent UK toothpaste ad where the advert starts with this screen saying, in the next advert, pay attention to the actor's gums because otherwise who in their right mind goes around paying, to people, paying attention to people's gums? So the whole point of this advert is to induce some dissatisfaction in you with your gums that you never knew you had. Um, and the second purpose of advertising is to get a brand noticed and remembered. Um, and we all know for that reason that emotional ads are the most effective ads. But from an ethical point of view, what is the long term impact of all this emotion for bombarding people with emotion, essentially stress, uh, priming them emotionally to think emotionally and react emotionally? Well, potentially that's making people more emotional, uh, less able to inhibit their impulses and regulate their behavior. Um, and that's potentially partly why we're seeing people seem to be so kind of hypersensitive and hyper emotional uh, these days. And a good um, a metaphor for that is in Dante's Inferno, the second, uh, the second circle of hell, people are punished for lust. Now, lust and luxury share the same Latin root. So this is more about um, indulging your senses than sex specifically. But people are punished for this uh, indulging of their passions by being blown around by, by winds for all of eternity. Um, and that's a good metaphor for, I think, all this emotional messaging, emotional priming could be having on people, re re removing their center of gravity, making them less stable and more easily kind of blown around and manipulated by their passions. And um, the saying goes, a man has as many masters as he has vices. Um, and advertising often wants to uh, inflame and exploit those vices in order to get you to buy a behavior. Um, but really, if we want to be ethical in advertising, it is all about uh, control and making people be their own master. So this idea that we have agency and control over ourselves and the world is very important for our well-being. Uh, if a dog feels that it can't escape an electrified cage, for example, it won't even bother to try, uh, which is learned helplessness. Um, so we really need to feel that we have control over the world um, to have well-being. For example, when asked to draw a target, the people on the left were primed to feel that they didn't have power or control. The people on the right were primed to feel that they did. And you can see the big difference in the output there. So that feeling of agency is, is psychologically important. And there's even some evidence to suggest it can help you live longer. Uh, so Nobel Prize winners live a bit longer than nominees. Uh, Academy Award winners live longer than nominees. And a similar finding was found for Olympic medal winners. Um, of course, correlation uh, doesn't equal causation, but there is a huge amount of consistent evidence that self-esteem and agency is important for well-being. And so uh, to summarize, uh, the cat is out of the bag on targeted psychographic messaging. Everyone is doing it. Potentially, it's not really that much worse than the effects of advertising traditionally above the line. Um, and above the line advertising, of course, doesn't uh, give people so much power and control to opt out of ads, to, uh, to, to have control over how the data is used and what type of ads they see. And that's what ethical um, targeted advertising is all about. It's about giving people that uh, agency. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to start with what I think is a potentially optimistic uh, take on this. And it's something that interests me quite a lot. Why this is considered so sinister and so disturbing is because currently the power to do this and indeed most of the understanding of this sits within sort of secretive entities. Mm -hmm. Now, one of my interesting discoveries when I became interested in behavioral science, strangely, was one that was entirely beneficial, which is that I no longer became angry with people with an opposing point of view. Yeah. Because having understood this science, let's face it, the first lesson of behavioral science is our behavior and our attitudes are heavily formed by context. And therefore, 
it pays off genuinely to understand that other people think differently to you because they're framing it differently, they've come at it differently, their background is different, whatever it may be. And so, you know, I can have, once I know they're kind of believers in behavioral science, I have completely amicable conversations with people right across the political spectrum, for example. I've got one friend who is the former member of the Black Panthers. And at no point does anybody who's what I might call versed in behavioral science become angry with someone else. It's a yeah. strangely inclusive discipline in that way. And that's simply because the recognition of difference, if it became more widespread, would have huge benefits. So let me, I'll, I'll give you two, two, I suppose, two little thoughts here. I've often said that, you know, you should teach Darwin in evolution at, at um, school, okay? And you should teach it quite extensively. And people go, well, it may not be true. And it doesn't matter if it's true or not, actually. <laughs> you know, whether, whether creationism is true, it doesn't matter. The fact is that learning Darwinian evolution brings with it a completely new way of looking at the world, which is less instrumentalist, less intentional. And in the same way, this is a way of looking at people and their behavior, which is less intentional, that you don't look at everything that happens as being the product of conscious designed intent. It can be simply the product of choice architecture or institutional design or, or contextual framing. And I, I see the wider spread of these skills and this understanding as actually being important in mutual understanding. So it's very strange that its first appearance has been used. I mean, I suppose you could say the same of Darwinism. The people who are the most enthusiastic adoptees weren't kind of the nicest guys in the, you know, in the room. But do you have a similarly optimistic take? Does it have the same effect on you? Uh, yeah, I think so. So, um, I mean, one of the things that I came to, to realise, I mean, I, I suppose I suspected it, but really realised is that everyone has the same motivations more or less everyone's a human everyone wants to feel safe and secure even though people come into uh, conflict uh, there's still uh, common ground um, and I know that there's studies with uh, prisoners that find that if you get them to read books it reduces recidivism rates because uh, it inculcates empathy um, uh, and I was also thinking that um, you know behavioral scientists know as you say that everyone is biased there's also the false dichotomy bias where everyone tends to see things in black and white. You're either for Brexit or against them. And so it's often the us versus them mentality. Um, potentially behavioral science can kind of help skirt that a bit. Where, where does it worry you? I mean, I've always been worried in the area of gambling, for example. That may be because I don't gamble. And so therefore, I'm disproportionately inclined to become moralistic about bad behaviors I don't indulge in. What, what would concern you the most about this? Um, so I, I firm a believer that um, sunlight is the best disinfectant, as uh, my old pops used to say, until he died of gangrene. Um, it's a joke. No, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you need to air things out into the light and, um, and if, you know, we need to talk and discuss. And even if people have objectionable ideas or are using things objectionably, if that's thrown into the light, then uh, again, life finds a way and, and the best thing kind of emerges, I believe and I hope. And here, here's another possibility, a great question actually just coming from Slido, which is, can you make messages that work for 100% of people using this insight? Because my argument would be maybe you can. And my argument would be that it might be possible to create something um, across something creatively, which actually resonates with more than one segment. Yeah. And so uh, one of the things I always say is that actually, if you look at a, a series of possible behavioral biases and you, and you say, we can't really tell which, I, I don't like the word bias very much anyway, we can't really tell which of these is at work in this setting. We can only theorize. On the other hand, if you say this or do this, it will actually answer about six of those possible questions in one go. And so I think sometimes in the way we design communications, we're look, once we've performed segmentation, we tend to then go, okay, we need to have one message per segment. And actually the best thing might be to use the segmentation to inform mass messaging. Chris Graves, who will appear later, talks quite a bit about this. Or you can change a message so that it isn't unintentionally offensive to uh, a particular segment as well. Yeah. So yeah. So you have kind of your umbrella proposition, and then the the different things that tap into that main proposition underneath. 
So, um, so Anna's frantically putting messages on the screen saying to wrap. That was absolutely fascinating. And I think we need to just think more broadly about the implications of this knowledge because it is kind of true and pretending it isn't, isn't going to make it go away. Yeah. Um, final Slido question, what's on my bookshelves? You'll never know because I cleverly put my webcam so far from my bookshelves that actually you can't read. It could be a whole section of uh, unbelievably worthy behavioral science and psychology books, or it could be part of my enormous collection of Japanese hentai. Uh, I'm afraid that's going to remain a mystery. OK, I just thought I'd let you know that. Thanks ever so much. Um, we'll wrap now, but uh, it's been a huge pleasure, Patrick. What a delight for you to come on. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody, to Nudge Stock. We are in hours five, and we have many, many, many more to go. Strap yourselves in. Today, we are incredibly proud to be raising money for the Red Cross, people who help people all around the world through difficult times, the one right now not withholding. We've all worked with our partners incredibly hard this year to bring behavioral science and Nudge Stock to your living rooms for free. So we'd love to ask, if you can, to go to nudgestock.co.uk forward slash festival dash pack to make your donation and to see how it can help. To help you along, we've added in a little nudge stock tax this year, just to have a few anchors in there to help you know what to donate. We have $11 in there. If you're still in your pajamas, head over to the festival pack page. Really delighted to say already we've raised over 4,000 pounds. That's a lot of you still in your pajamas. Have some self-respect. Just around the corner, we have the world famous behavioral economist, Dan Ariely. But before that, I'm delighted to introduce to you another Nudstock veteran, veteran, Jenny Roper. She's head of insight at out of phone media company Kinetic, and she has access to some incredible data that the likes of us don't normally get to see, data around terror threats and COVID-19. And she's about to share that with us today. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce to you onto the stage, Jenny Roper. Brilliant. Thank you, Dan. Nice to see a friendly face and hello to everyone at Nudgestock. So yeah, my name is Jenny and I lead the Insight team here at Kinetic. So we're an out-of-home media agency based in London and we bill £350 million annually in the UK. And a big part of my job is to understand people's daily travel routines. And this is in order to optimise out-of-home audience ad placements and strategy. And well, as you can imagine, um, COVID-19 has really impacted this. So in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to demonstrate to you how an understanding of social proof has helped to accurately predict UK election results and how using these techniques can help to predict how people will travel in the coming weeks and months as the UK government eases lockdown restrictions. 
So it really is important for our business to be able to accurately predict people's travel patterns and how they will change in the near future. So this is data from Kinetic's Journeys platform. It links several data sets, including mobile SDK data with poster sites. So in other words, we know when a mobile handset has been passed a specific poster. Each time a mobile handset goes past a poster, this counts as an impact. And we can see that lockdown has really affected people's travel habits. They were less likely to go to the supermarket, although interestingly, they spent the same amount each week in bricks and mortar stores. People are less likely to travel by road and even less likely to travel by train. And by mid-May, we can see that audience impact delivery is down but it is starting to recover. But so what? I mean, we're in early June. Who cares what happened three weeks ago? Do you know what? Big data is great, but it is historical. Mobile phones don't deliver SDK data back immediately. There's a two week time lag once the data is cleaned and processed. Oh, and I needed to deliver this presentation a week in advance. So, what level is the audience at today? Where will it be next week? Um, when will out of home impacts only be down by a third? These are the critical business questions that I'm asked by Kinetic and our clients. Now, one way to answer this is mathematically. So you could do a linear regression as shown with a pink line to predict how audiences will grow. But hang on a minute, please don't leave. This isn't gonna be a maths lesson. But the one thing to bear in mind is the situation the UK finds itself in today really is different from three weeks ago. So last week, the UK government announced that some children could return to school. And next week, large retail stores will be open. And this really will affect travel patterns. But when will things return to no normal? Will COVID-19 stop us? Will it create any new normals? So here we have an ad from the New York Stock Exchange that they put out last month. They show powerful images of 9-11 and the Great Depression with the copy, it did not stop America. They sent out a clear message that COVID-19 won't stop America. And we're looking to see how and if COVID-19 will create any new behaviors it is worthwhile looking to the past. 7-7 and 9-11 heavily impacted people's travel habits in the short term. However, they did not create a new normal. After 7-7, Transport for London reported more people traveling on the tube the following year, and numbers have continued to increase at a pace. With 9-11, airports were closed for just two days and it took three years for annual airline numbers in the US to exceed those prior to the bombings. However, it did not create a new normal for traveling. What this does demonstrate is that just because restrictions are lifted, it doesn't mean people will immediately go back to their old behaviors. I mean, eventually they might. And whilst the terrorist threat is different to the threat of COVID-19, Understanding why there were no new normals from a terrorist threat can help us to understand if COVID-19 will create a paradigm shift in the way people live their daily lives. And if we do see a shift on the horizon, how should we change our strategic planning for our clients moving forward? And do you know what? This is a really interesting question for commuting to work. Will it employers and employees have the commitment to adapt their nine to five working habits once the threat of the pandemic has gone? And do you know what? This is something I'll be keeping a really close eye on. But to understand if a change in behavior will stick, you need to appreciate the motivation and commitment behind the change. So motivation is why you do something and commitment relates to how long you stick at it for. So in both cases of 7-7 and 9-11, people didn't have the commitment to stick with their new travel habits. The new ways of traveling were not more convenient. The reason air travel took longer to recover post 9-11, people just don't fly that often. 7-7 affected the daily commute and people bounced back much faster. Once the threat or motivation for the change in behavior passes, 
if you haven't built up a commitment to change, you will revert back to your old habits and there'll be no behavior shift. So bringing this back to the present day, under the threat of COVID-19, will there be any new normals? And to understand this, you have to think, is the changed behavior more convenient or better? Will people have the commitment to stick with the new behavior once restrictions are lifted? And you know what? Just because the government says you can, it doesn't mean you will. Last week in the UK, the government announced schools would open in England. With the current threat of COVID-19, you might be reluctant to send your child back to school. The reason you might be swayed to send your child back is not because the government tells you, but because most of the other parents in their class are sending their children back. And this demonstrates the power of social proof. So social proof means we are motivated to do things when we think other people are doing it. And Cialdini coined the term in 1984 on one of his most noted experiments. It was to do with towel reuse in hotels. So if you've ever stayed in a hotel, you've probably seen those little cards in your room asking you to reuse your towel to help save the planet. Cialdini demonstrated that by telling people 75% of people reuse their towel was a more powerful message than telling people they were helping to save the planet. Now, what is sometimes overlooked is that Cialdini tested more than one descriptive norm message. The message was tailored to say either the most guests of your gender, guests in your hotel, or guests previously staying in your room reused their towel. Now, the highest rate of compliance was amongst guests who've been told that most guests previously staying in their room had reused their towel. The hotel descriptive norm was more compelling than the gender descriptive norm, demonstrating it's just not how much we identify with someone, but whether they've been in a similar situation. So when restrictions were eased in the UK, many teenagers were quick out of the door. It doesn't matter what the government said, but what their peers were doing. But you know what? It really is difficult to predict what people will do in the future. Back in June 2016, it wasn't just a bad night for Eurofiles and David Cameron, it was also a bad night for market research. Of the 168 polls carried out since the EU referendum, less than a third, 55 in fact, predicted the UK would vote to leave the EU. And just 16 of the 168 surveys predicted a 52-48 split in favour of Lee. Now, what many of these surveys have in common is they asked people how they intended to vote. However, this forgets that we are social creatures. And social proof tells us it is better to ask, how will people in your area vote rather than how you will vote? So Muir, Stigma and Lewis Beck are strong proponents of using social proof research techniques, what they refer to as a vote expectation model. Vote expectation models outperform vote intention models in predicting both the winning party and the party's share of seats. The vote expectation model is a better predictor of behaviour change. And at Kinetic, we're using this technique in our Alfresco Life surveys to monitor likely changes in the UK travel habits. And this feeds into our future out of home audience predictions. So how can we utilize social proof? We're not only asking people what they plan to do as restrictions are lifted, but what they think people in their area will do. This really is a better predictor of future behavior. So we're asking questions like, do you think your work colleagues will change how they commute to work? And from a marketing perspective, brands really would do well to utilise social proof in their communication. Putting out messages like London's most popular and stores less busy during these times. It's really difficult to predict what will happen in the coming months and if there will be any new normals. However, behavioural science really is a useful tool to blend with survey data and big data sets. But for an accurate prediction, you need to ask the right questions, pick the right nudge and use the best data sets.
And if you want to know my predictions, well, you'll need to ask me yourself. Please email me and I'll send you over our full report and predictions for the out-of-home market in the coming weeks and months. And even if you just enjoyed this session, it would also be great to hear from you. Thanks for your time and have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much, Jenny. That was absolutely wonderful. I always love hearing from you. I always find Babel Science such a, playing in such a surprising space in out of home here and always, always having quite an interesting thing to say. So thank you for sharing some of that data with us today. It's absolutely fantastic. Moving on, we would love to thank our partners for today for helping today to make possible. Our first is the B2B Institute, a think tank into the human behavior in business funded by LinkedIn, as well as creative online learning company, 42 courses, um, where today, pens and papers at the ready, if you write down the code NUDGESTOCK2020, if you go to their website, 42courses.com, you can get a discount on the Rory Sutherland Behavioral Economics course. And also love to thank our many friends of NUDGESTOCK that you can find at nudgestock.co.uk. Now, all of us here at NUDGESTOCK behind the scenes are absolutely giddy to be introducing our next speaker. We have been trying to get him at NUDGESTOCK for many, many, many years, and today um, it was possible. Old or young, if you speak to someone who's come into the, the behavioral sciences, you can pretty much guarantee that Dan Ariely would have been a part, if not the start of that journey. Through his TED Talks and his best-selling books, he's inspired millions around the world to be interested and engaged in behavioral science. And I think it's fair to say that without Dan Ariely, the movement of behavioral science would not be where it is today. So we owe an eternal gratitude to Dan. At the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, Dan was called back to Israel to help on their response. So he's here to talk to us about how he is going to be, uh, how he has been working on, on the COVID-19 response in Israel and how he thinks the whole world will be coming out of this in a longer term view. It's my absolute pleasure, it's all of our absolute pleasures to be introducing to you Professor Dan Ariely. My name is Dan Ariely and I'm the James B. Duke Professor of Psychology and Behavioral Economics and I'm coming to you from my mother's kitchen in Israel. I have this lovely um, painting behind me, I'm just kind of showing you the, the painting. Um, and I've basically been on this uh, chair for about seven weeks <coughs> looking at this uh, painting <coughs> uh, for all this time. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, uh, you might have noticed that I have half a beard and you might have wondered why or what kind of bet I lost. Uh, well, I didn't lose a bet. I was uh, badly burned uh, when I was much, much, much younger. Um, about 70% of my body was burned. Most of my body is covered with scars, including the right side of my face. So I just don't have hair. Uh, these are all just scars and it looks sort of symmetrical, but it's not. It's not really. Okay. Now let's uh, get, we, we've covered facial hair, I think that's topic number one, let's, let's move to something else. So um, up to about uh, seven weeks ago, uh, two months ago, I was uh, a Duke uh, working in my lab and then I started getting uh, lots and lots and lots of phone calls from uh, different governments, mostly from the Israeli government about the Corona crisis. At some point it was clear that it's very hard to help remotely, so I came to Israel where I'm now and um, in this in this process I, I got to tackle lots of things that uh, are corona related in the beginning they asked for my help with some very simple uh, seemingly simple things like how do you give people instructions with the hope that people would uh, adhere to the instruction uh, for example if you say to people stay at home will they listen uh, what if you say stay up to 100 meters outside of your home, but don't exercise. Or yes, go to the pharmacy and grocery store, but nothing else. I mean, what do you do with people who have to go to work? So we started thinking about how you actually give instructions in a way that makes them feel desirable and appropriate and easy to know if you're following the rules or not. And then we had some specific cases with Orthodox Jews and Muslims during Ramadan. Then it was clear that the education system was completely unset for remote learning. So we started studying what kind of combinations work better and worse in this, in this kind of world. And how do you take the resource that kids have at home and utilize them in a better way? For example, you have three kids and only two computers. What do you do? Do you pair two kids up, even if they're not exactly at the same level? 
uh, to learn something. And um, then it turned out really sadly that um, domestic violence has increased. Uh, some against women, a lot against kids. What do you do with that? And we came up with two plans for uh, reducing domestic violence. How does the government give money? What, is, what are the right ways to do it to try and stimulate the economy and to reduce uh, stress? Uh, what do you do with taxes? Uh, what do you do with prisoners? Uh, there was a, a big fear. Um, uh, tracking people. How do you trade off privacy concerns versus accuracy of the information? Anyway, um, it, it's been fascinating. Um, and and um, among, among all the conversations, one of the things became, became very clear is that uh, we're not set up for these, for these situations. And, and my kind of meta insight about all of this is that uh, the world is really trying to focus on efficiency. Uh, what's efficient? Imagine an efficient airline. A plane lands, people deplane, they clean it, they fuel it, new food is coming up, new people in takes off. An efficient hospital, 100% capacity of beds. Uh, an efficient factory, a pro a raw material comes in, process, leaves the minute it's being created. And if you thought of a continuum between efficiency and resilience, we've gone to efficiency very, very much. We, we hate seeing waste. So as individuals, we don't want to have three months in cash sitting somewhere. If we have money, we want it to work for us in the stock market, let's say, or in some uh, investment. If we're in a business, we want everything to be efficient. We don't want to have extra merchandise sitting there just in case. If we're running a hospital, we don't want 10% extra bed just in case. And we have this drive toward making things more and more efficient because every time we make a small efficiency improvement, we see the benefits. Uh, but of course, resilient systems are incredibly important. Uh, so think about small businesses that did not have two or three months money uh, in access waiting. Uh, those businesses are going to start either going into bankruptcy, will have to borrow money, they'll have to pay the interest, things are going to go, get worse and worse for them. Now, now in a human way, uh, we are not built to create systems that uh, create resilience. But I think the corona crisis is showing very much that we have to start, to start doing it. Uh, by the way, the only places that really do it are things like the military. We don't come to the military and say, show us what you need for the next month and we'll just pay you for that. No, in the military we understand we have to prepare for all kinds of contingencies. Turns out we need it not just in the, in the military. And that's really a big question is how do we prepare for resilience? How do we take small probabilities of things going badly, it comes from all kinds of things and, and incorporate it. So that's kind of a big, uh, a big thought. I don't have a good answer for this, but I know we have to prepare for it. Personally, uh, companies, society. Um, but, but today I, I want to basically kind of cover uh, three topics. Uh, why did we react so strongly to the corona crisis? Uh, why is it so bad? And um, how do we get out of it? Okay, so let's start with topic number one. Why did we react so strongly to this? And I want us to start by thinking about the identifiable victim effect. And if you remember, there was a little girl called Baby Jessica that many, many years ago got stuck in a well. She, she fell very deeply. She was stuck there. It was a very narrow place. It was very hard to, to take her out. It took more than a day. And, you know, she was covered on CNN. And, and the person who eventually took her out, his picture was on... on, um, on, was on um, a Time, Time Magazine as the, 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 the person of the year. Uh, amazing, amazing story. Uh, but it turns out that she got uh, more coverage than Rwanda and Darfur put together. How come? And, and the reality is that one cute little girl stuck in a well is really um, pulls at the heartstrings. Right? We're really attached to that. And, and we want to know what happened and we wanted to save. And when the tragedy is very, very large, uh, we don't feel the same. Or think about another story. 
Imagine that you're going to a job interview. In 15 minutes, you have a job interview. It's the job interview of your life. You've dreamt about this job and you're sure you'll get it. If you'll just get the job interview, you'll get the job. They promise you. It's the final interview. You've done 10 of them. It's the 11th interview. The job is basically yours and you have a new suit, a new um, underwear, new socks, and new shoes and you're so excited. And you're walking over a bridge and as you walk toward the end, you hear a cry and, and you look you look from the side of the bridge and you see a baby drowning. Now, if you jump to save that day, baby, no job interview, you lose your job, 100% sure. Uh, if you go, you will not save the baby, but, but you'll get the job. Now, what's the rational thing to do? The rational thing to do is to say, let me go and get the job. This is just one baby. I'll get the job and I'll, I'll donate 10% of my income for the rest of my life to uh, missions that save babies' lives. And by doing that, I'll save lots of babies. I mean, it's very cheap to save babies. Like, why spend all this amount of money, all my future income and my happiness and so on, on, on one baby? I can save many, many babies in the future. But of course, it's, it seems crazy. I mean, that's the economic rational thing to do, but it sounds cruel. I mean, uh, like a sociopath, who would want to be that person that says that? Of course, nobody. So what we do is we jump, we save the baby, and we give up a lot. Now, why am I mentioning this about a corona crisis? Is that um, we have this image of people dying, that we could prevent it, and we also have an image of people dying without air, choking to death, without respirators, without ventilators. And that's just unbelievably painful for us. And because of that, because it's so painful, like the, the baby drowning, uh, we do a lot of things to, to protect it. Now, the corona crisis is very sad, and yeah, certainly it's, it's, it's horrific that people, people die, but uh, people die a lot yeah, for all kinds of reasons. You know, if you um, came to Earth from another planet a year ago, and you said, these Earthlings, how much do they care about people who are old and sick? And you would look at what do we do? You would say, not that much. They don't seem to care that much. Uh, there's not uh, uh, good hospitals for the elderly. Uh, we don't do preventative care. Uh, and medications are limited. We don't seem to care that much. All of a sudden, if you came now during Corona time, you say, wow, these Earthlings really care about people who are sick. Now, now, why is this inconsistency? Right? I mean, in regular days, we could, have say, we could have spent on an average year another you know, trillion dollars or you know, billion dollars. So we could spend all kinds of money to make people's lives better. But we usually don't care. All of a sudden we care a lot. Right? We're gambling the whole economy on, on this. What, what happened? And I think that the analogy to the identifiable victim effect is, is very much there. Um, there are things that we don't think about that much. Uh, people dying in car accidents, uh, people dying from smoking, from cancer, from diabetes, uh, respiratory uh, problems, uh, heart problems. Yes, we care, but, but we care a little. We don't care that much. And all of a sudden, we care a lot. And I think what happened is that we have this image of a death that is caused by a virus. By the way, it also helps the virus is frightening. It's on the news. We keep on thinking of it all the time, right? Unlike malaria, for example, that we haven't thought about for, for a long time. And, and, then, and then this image of somebody dying because we didn't do something and somebody dying without breathing, kind of choking to death. That, that's just a very, very painful thought together with constantly looking at the news and being fed by it, which is causing us to, to react in a very, very strong way. So, of course, there are other reasons that got us to uh, react so strongly. Lack of knowledge, uncertainty, fear was very high. Uh, we didn't know how much we could trust the information coming out from China. Um, so there are the other reasons as well. There was a combination of factors, but, but one of them is the identifiable. It's not so much the identifiable victim effect, it's the identifiable cause effect. There is something there about to hurt us with a very strong image of people dying because we didn't do much and people dying without respirators and ventilators. And that was just very, very hard for us 
nationally. So we took lots of actions. Okay, second point. Why, why is it so bad? You could say, look, the corona crisis is a two, three months thing. Uh, it's like summer vacation. Like, why, why do we predict such a big uh, economic catastrophe? You know, why, why is it so disproportionate? And, and the answer is that our economic system has very little resilience. And that economics is less about percentage, or, or let me say differently, uh, the model, I think, is a bit more like biology, is that you have a tree, and the tree yields fruit. And as long as there's enough water, you get fruit. And if there's not enough water, the tree is not providing you with a proportional amount, there's zero uh, fruit, or, or uh, dramatically, dramatic decrease. So imagine we have a bookstore, and every day we sell 100 books. Do we make profit on all 100 books? No. Uh, maybe we break even at 90 books, and the last 10 books give us profit. But if we sell 98 books, we lose money. So, so, so what happened is that every day we sell 100 books and we make a little bit of profit. All of a sudden, Corona comes. Do we sell 100 books? No, we sell zero. Now, every month we accumulate debt we make zero income. And what are we going to do with this debt? We, we were barely living. We, we only made money on 10 books, right? We didn't save that much. And now every month we get more into debt and more into debt. And now we need to borrow money. We have to service the debt plus the interest, right? And you can say, oh, it's two months. No, it's a lot. It's a lot. Because if we only made a small amount of money up to now, how are we going to make this extra moving forward? And also, Corona days are not going to be over all of a sudden. Uh, because imagine that we have like two, three months of, of zero sales, and then they're going to open the markets. Are we going to jump back to 100 books? No. Maybe we'll jump back to 50. And that means that every month we'll open our bookstore, we'll lose more money. Because remember, we have to get to a certain level to just break, just break even. So we have a lot of periods in which we had cost and no income. Uh, we have expenses, but no income. Uh, many people would have to take loans. Their future profits will have to service those loans and the interest rate. And it will take a while until, until we scale up our, our expenses again. And for a long time, these businesses could uh, keep, on, keep on losing money. So, so why is it so bad? Because lack of resilience and because uh, businesses need a lot of money just to break just to break even that's that's the structure and if we count on at least breaking even and that and then getting more um, uh, there could be a long period in which businesses will keep on will keep on losing money uh, and now for the for the third point is how do we get how do we get out of this and um, I, I think in general uh, the corona crisis have, have shown two big things. One is that society is very fragile, as it, we started with, right? It, we don't have resilience, where it's very, very fragile. One thing's break, lots of things break as a consequence. So it's, we're very fragile and we really need each other. Those are um, uh, very, very important, important points. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, and I'll, I'll tell you a story about, uh, about this, this need to, to collaborate because I think that an important way to get out of this will mean that we have to, to help each other. Um, so there's a, there's a game uh, we call the public goods game. And the game looks like this. Uh, you have uh, 10 people, let's say 10, we, we randomly sample uh, 10 people in the US. And we call them in the morning and say, hey, you were sampled together with nine other people. And here's the game. Uh, every day we'll call you and every day we'll give you $10. And we'll do it for a while. And you could do one of two things with those $10. You could keep the money to yourself or you could put the money in a central pot. Keep the money to yourself or put it in a central pot. If you keep it to yourself, you're $10 richer. 
if you put it in the central pot, all the money that the other, that you and the other nine people will put in the central pot will grow five times during the day and in the evening equally divide by everybody. And by the way, you'll never know who the other people are. It will be perfectly anonymous. And that's the game. And we play day after day after day, after day for a while. What happens? You start playing this game. You call 10 people in the morning, you tell them the rules, you give them $10, and they all put the money in the central pot. 10 people put $10 each, $100, right? 10 multiplied by 10. During the day, it grows up five times. In the evening, equally divide by everybody. So in the morning, we have $10, everybody puts the money in, $100, multiply five times, $500, equally divide by everybody, everybody gets $50. Right? Life is great. You wake up with 10, you go to sleep with 50, and life continues like this for a while. And then one day, one person decides to put zero in. You can probably think about your friends, who would be that person? One day, one person decides to put zero in. Now, nine people put $10 each, $90, multiply five times $450. In the evening, equally divide by the 10 people, because the bastard who didn't give money still gets something. Um, uh, but the bastard has $55. They have their $10 from the morning plus the $45 they got from the uh, public good. And, and uh, now the question is, what happens the next day? And what happens the following day? And the answer is that very quickly nobody puts money in. And this is a game with two equilibria. There's a good equilibria in which everybody participates and everybody benefits. Everybody wakes up with 10, goes to sleep with 50. And there's a bad equilibrium in which nobody participates and nobody makes money. There's not a stable solution in the middle. Like if half the people give and half the people don't, it doesn't work. It's either everybody or nobody. And the other thing that happened is that when everybody participates, everybody benefits. And it's a very weak equilibrium. If we're in a good equilibrium, it's enough for one person to deviate, one person to betray the public good, that the whole thing starts to deteriorate. If we're in a bad equilibrium where nobody participates and nobody contributes, and one day, let's say for three months, nobody puts money, nobody puts money, nobody, one day two people put money, what happened the next day? It goes back to 100%? No, it goes back to, to zero. And the reason I'm giving you this metaphor is that this metaphor of the public good is really kind of the kind of things we can do together, uh, right? Uh, separately, uh, we can't build roads and we can't build hospitals and we can't invest in research and um, uh, clean air, all kinds of things. We can't do it separately. If we each were an island, we couldn't do all these amazing things. We do them together by pooling our resources, right? And that's the metaphor for the public good game is we put our money together and the reason it grows is because we, we, we can do things together that we couldn't do separately. Hospitals, really, really important. Clean water, really, really important. Can we do it separately if we each lived in a different place? No. We have to, to pull our resources together. That's the first point, is we have to help, to help each other. And the second thing is that if people, some people defect, some people betray the public goods, uh, the whole thing, the whole thing collapses. And I think this is one of the keys for the, for the economy, is that you know, the government is going to inject lots of money in, and uh, I'm personally not worried about the banks, I think they'll be fine, and uh, probably airline companies, but, but the small businesses around us uh, are not. Uh, they're not going to get enough money from the government. There's not enough money uh, in, in, that the government could, could give those, uh, those small businesses, and it's our job to keep it to keep it alive. And, and we have to realize that we all need to contribute. Um, you know, we, we sometimes think about our economic environment as, as we're being in competition. Oh, I want to pay a little bit less for coffee, or my, my local um, uh, grocery store is a little too expensive, why aren't they as cheap as the, as the big one? Uh, but the reality is that we're not in competition with those, we are in a symbiotic collaborative relationship. We want them to stay alive. My life is better off when my local grocery store is open and when my uh, local coffee shop is open and even the art gallery not too far from me, even though I don't uh, buy much from there, uh, is, is, is important 
uh, is important to me. So the question is, you know, are we going to get together and, and help each other? And I don't know, it's a real question. I mean, there's a, there's a risk that we will all be a little stressed and try to keep the money that we have and not want to spend it. And of course, then we will make the problem larger and larger. It will take longer and longer for businesses to get into uh, break even. Or we might create new rules for ourselves and say, let's go out. Uh, I can tell you that in our lab at, at Duke, uh, we pick a, a local business every week. <clears throat> and everybody in the lab, we're only 50 people, but everybody in the lab uh, spends $100 on that, on that business. And sometimes those businesses are closed and we just say, here's $100, from 5000 from all of us, and we'll, we'll come and buy merchandise in the future. Now, that's $5,000 a week. It's not a lot of money. But if we all did things like that, we would help. So the, the, the question is, how would we get out of this? Only if we work together. Working together is an incredible uh, opportunity, and we need to figure out how to, how to do this. And then one more thing about getting out of this. Um, we, we, we will have long periods in which our habits would change. Um, right? We had lots of habits, like going to coffee and restaurants and bars, and walking out and hugging people. And, you know, we had a lot of habits and Corona time came and whoops, uh, our um, range of behaviors have shrunk a lot. We, we're doing some things more, like maybe sleeping more. Actually, we have some research people are sleeping a little bit more, uh, certainly watching more, more TV, uh, watching the news more. Uh, what would happen after? And, and, and I want us to think about habits and how, how will things change as, as uh, we open the gates a little bit and what will go back and what will not go back. And I want to give you one kind of principle, which is learning from experience and what is that predicting about uh, going back. So, so imagine something like um, grocery shopping, going to the supermarket. Um, the gates will open. Uh, they'll tell us we can go back to sort of normal life, maybe with social distancing, maybe with, with mask, and we will go back and we'll go back to work and we'll go back to supermarkets and we'll be very afraid in the beginning because we've been kind of anxious and at home and uh, wash our hands a lot and all of a sudden we go out and who has corona and who is not and what am I touching and what am I not touching but we'll go to work and we'll go to the grocery store and some other things and those things will teach us that things are not as dangerous right now our panic or, you know, when, when the gates will open, our panic will be higher than the real risk, right? The real risk is high, it's getting lower, the real risk is going to be low and the panic will be higher uh, for many of us who have been locked and, and thinking about the risk for a long time. And what, what will happen is that things like going to a grocery store and going to work uh, will learn that things are not as, as dangerous. Uh, one day we'll bump into somebody. And the first time we'll bump into somebody, says, oof, you know, this, this, is, this, is this bad? And one day we'll, we'll uh, use a cup for coffee or for water that is not ours in the, in the kitchen of our workplace. And we'll worry about this. And one day we'll forget to wash the, our hands as, as thoroughly. And we'll worry about it. But we'll have these experiences that will teach us that it's not as dangerous. Uh, one day we'll forget our mask and we'll see that nothing happens. So, so what happened is that initially the panic will be higher than the risk and then o over time the panic will go down because we'll have these feedback loops. Uh, but there are other uh, categories. Uh, for example, going to the movies or going to a nightclub to dance uh, that nobody is going to force us into them, right? We're not going to tell people, okay, every Friday night for the next three months you have to go to a nightclub on Friday night. No, it's not going to happen. And on those things, the, the gap between our fear and reality is going to stay high because the experience is not going to, to moderate it. So one of the things we need to realize is that people are not really good at learning from description. People are much better in learning from experience, for good and for bad. Sometimes we learn the wrong lessons, but we learn much better from experience. And we need to think about how is life going back going to go back to normal via an experience. Okay, so we said work is going to be fine. And by the way, if I, for my group, in the beginning, I'm going to tell them 
take your time. Uh, please come to work, but if you want to come for shorter, it's fine. You want to go and work some from home, it's fine. I don't want people to get stressed and I want them to basically learn over time that this is not dangerous. I don't want to tell them it's not dangerous. I want them to experience that it's not dangerous and to get used to it. The other category is like Disney uh, going to movies, going to nightclubs that are going to uh, suffer for a large degree. Now, is this, is this written in stone or can we change it? I think we can change it. Uh, so for example, one of the recommendations I'm making to cities is to think about what are intermediate institutions that we can create. So for example, think about coffee shops. Can we get people to go into busy coffee shops like we did before Corona? No. People would see a very busy coffee shop, they will not go in. What if we ask the coffee shop to spread out, uh, have more table, have more chairs, uh, one, one city Tel Aviv here, I recommended the city hall gives them the four parking spaces next. That's a spread out. Take a lot of space. Get people to sit. Big distances. Outside. And after two weeks, make the chairs a little closer and a little closer, a little closer. Back to the sidewalk, back into the coffee shop. Those are the kind of institutions that we need because we need to give people the experience of, of being less. Uh, less stressed. So to summarize, uh, Corona time, absolutely awful in all kinds of ways. It, uh, incredibly fascinating for social scientists in a, in a terrible, sad way. It also demonstrates the importance of understanding human, human psychology. And, and I think there's a couple of really interesting things here. Like about why did we react so strongly? Uh, why are we going to suffer? Uh, so long and what are we learning from this and for me the learning from this is about resilience and how how important it is it's about how much we need each other and we need to collaborate economically and and socially and it's also about how do we need to rethink our institutions in order to uh, basically teach ourselves that we need to be less uh, afraid of life and over time uh, hopefully uh, go back to uh, our less anxious self. And with this, uh, I will end here and I will just say thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Dan Ariely. We were all gripped throughout that entire presentation. I'm so thrilled you could finally make it to speak at Nudstock. And there's just something really comforting, I think, about knowing that Dan Ariely is working on COVID-19. It just feels like everything's going to be okay now. The big burning question on everyone's lips who are, who are getting in contact is, will today be recorded? And the answer is yes, but that doesn't mean you can leave right now because we've got some great speakers coming up. The thing we want to talk to you before that is that we've already done one session of these, but another session will be coming up later on if you missed out. For this year, we are launching our first time, the Nudgestock Side Tents. Eight different side tents that you can pre-register right now um, to hear about the area of behavioral science that you want to hear more about. And you'll see these on the screen. And if you go to nudgestock.co.uk and click on the side tents tab, you can now pre-register for the side tent of your choice that's coming up in about two hours or so. Now, attention, attention, attention. Uh, our next speaker has a special request of you. You're unfortunately going to have to get off, off, your, off your bottoms and go and find a pen and a paper. You're going to need to do some with, something with a pen and a paper in this next talk. And while you go and grab that pen and a paper, and I'm sure you are doing that, um, I'd like to introduce Dan Bukowski, who's a, basically a very big design cheese who's done every single design job you can imagine. So he's currently the chief design officer of Deloitte Banking Group. He leads a multidisciplinary design team whose sole purpose is to help the UK, help Britain prosper through empathetic and courageous design. He's also, just to list a few, been head of design at Walmart, He's been part of Project Aura at Google, that modular phone, and also was behind the first um, Surface at Microsoft. Um, so an incredible design history. We're thrilled he's here to talk with us today. And if you do want to second screen this experience and see Dan's Instagram, he's also an incredible dancer. So I'm really thrilled to introduce to you Dan McCoskey. Thanks so much for that. I am so excited to be here with you at Nudgestock 
Because I believe that behavioral economics and science applied to design is the most powerful tool of innovation right now. And I want to talk to you a bit about how my team at Lloyd's Banking Group is using those that combination of behavioral science and design to move forward. So first of all, as mentioned in the intro, I'm a designer. My goal is to bring moments of joy and impact to people's lives. And for the last 10 years, I've done that in Silicon Valley for some big tech companies. And so you can imagine it was a bit of an emotional challenge to kind of move across the ocean two years ago. And to now say that in addition to a designer, I am a banker. Because for a lot of people, banking and design, it just feels kind of like an oxymoron. And you can see why. You know, when I was at Google, I was wondering, should I go into banking at all? And I did this search um, and I used Google's autocomplete data results as an insight into the current state of finances and design. So if you do this search in Google for finances are, you'll see a pretty incredible list of the top terms that people are actually searching on. So finances are ruining my marriage. They're stressing me out. They're tight. They're out of control. This is such a data-driven snapshot of how disconnected people are from money. So what an amazing place to go to solve one of the great unsolved problems about how to make finances more human. But you know, the conversation right now, particularly when it comes to the future of banking, is all about hashtag fintech. And while Clearly, I love technology, given the companies I've worked for. It's not just about fintech. In fact, I feel like my, my goal as a designer in banking is to help people just make sense of their finances. So I don't know if this hashtag will catch on. You got 25,000 of, of y'all. Maybe y'all can start it. But um, this is really about bringing together the left and the right brains. Because banking is traditionally very analytical and rational. And the right brain is a little bit more intuitive and creative. And I think those of you that have been tinkering with applied behavioral science know that we have new insights about how the brain works and how to get it all to work together. So let me talk a little bit about the organization of design at Lloyd's Banking Group. And then I'll share a little bit more about how we're thinking about a brand new metaphor in banking. Because no matter how much you do behavioral science applied to the space, you're not going to have breakthroughs unless you have a new environment. And then I'll end with a couple of insights on how we're applying some principles to, to design. So the way that we think about innovation, many of you have seen this diagram, um, is around technical, human, and business factors of innovation. And, you know, the technical bits, which is all about feasibility, what can we do? And the business bits, which is all about viability, are pretty strong, actually. Uh, within banking in general. It's the human bits about desirability which needs to be amplified. So the first thing that I did a couple years ago when I joined as the first chief design officer at Lloyd's Banking Group was to pull together all of the capabilities across the organization around what I'll call big D design. So we have everything from design research to systemic or systems design, service design, business design, etc. And you know, we actually haven't yet a formally created our behavioral design guild, but we're just about to start that because we're starting to apply insights from behavioral design, uh, from behavioral science into design. So we pulled all of these teams into one unified design group. Here's what they look like. A really cool, awesome group of folks from across the UK. And the first thing that this team did when they came together was to define what is our purpose. And given that Lloyd's Banking Group's mission is to help Britain prosper, the team quite simply said, well, we're here to design for prosperity. And which is a wonderful thing to put design at the strategic core of a company's mission. But it's also a little bit vague. So I challenged the team to articulate it at a deeper level. And so the team came back with, what if prosperity is helping people just end the day a bit better than it started? Now, this applies to households or businesses at any stage. And all of a sudden, this phrase put the team directly into the thinking of habit formation. Well, how do we make prosperity tangible on a daily basis? And we said, well, what does prosperity actually mean to people? 
So we have these design labs uh, across all of our studios across the UK. And of course we bring people in for usability research, but more and more we're doing co-creation and we're doing uh, Lego creative play. And we did this session where we had people map out their finances. And by the way, we're gonna do a little bit of a co-creation session together. So I know you've already been warned, but please get your post-it note or paper and something to draw with. Cause in a little bit, I'm gonna have you draw. Get ready, it'll be fun. Don't worry, we'll get through it. Um, so when we ask people to describe what finances mean to them, what does prosperity mean to them? They actually didn't talk about bank accounts and numbers. They talked about relationships and moments in life or moments in their business evolution. So this is one example where people mapped out their, what prosperity is. And it's all about my spouse, my partner, my kids, milestones in life. And we started recognizing that the language of banking is really foreign to how people think about money. And so we started creating this life map of these key moments and asking ourselves the question, how well are we preparing people for these moments when it comes to their finances? You know, I've got a couple of kids that have recently left the home and I've never talked to any financial institution about those moments, but I'm feeling all this anxiety about, I've got a son in China who, you know, apart from all the COVID bits, which are worrying, there's also like, does he know how to pay bills? Does he have the right kind of credit card? I mean, is he ready for that kind of stage of life? So we started to try to balance that left brain bank thinking with stories. And so we had this amazing storytelling team of videographers and animators and illustrators, and we actually created a graphic novel about what is what would banking be like if it was much more human around this idea of life moments? And it was really pretty amazing because we're almost doing internal behavioral science experiments on how do these new ways of describing things resonate? So we have something in our backlog around real-time notifications on iOS and Android. And this little story here about a father and a daughter just managing their finances on the go helped bring that kind of empathetic and emotional quality. And so we're, you know, we're starting to concept out some dashboards like this that start to lay out aspects of life and how do financial services fit into that. And even more importantly, we actually had this little concept of a, uh, a view of your banking profile of relationships. Well, here's me and here's my spouse and here's my parents and here's where I live and here's where I work. And there's actually pretty important financial relationships that are circling around these views. And so we're in the early phases of seeing how this will play out. But when we started looking at how do you go beyond that, as we looked at other parts of the dashboard, we just started getting into kind of normal metaphors of dials and bars and charts. And we just, we realized we needed a new metaphor. So I'm going to talk a bit about a metaphor, then I'll get into some behavioral science bits. So don't worry, we'll, we'll get there in a second. So first of all, we realized that the metaphor that we're in now in the financial world is actually uh, comes from the 1400s. And this is one of our archivists um, up at the Bank of Scotland, up in Edinburgh. These are our founding documents from the bank. And there's loads and loads of these books. These books are called ledgers. And this ledger was a metaphor borrowed from the church in the 1400s as a really structured way to look at information and attendance and contributions. And some banker you know, in the 1400s, some weekend was like, hashtag fintech innovation. Let's take this ledger and apply it to banking. And it took off because we never really had this way of structuring financial information with trust. And now 450 plus years later, when we look at experiences in banking as we digitize and go mobile, et cetera, I ask myself, have we really gone beyond that ledger? And maybe it's time for a new metaphor. So one, one example of the power of new metaphors comes from computer science. This was 18th century weaving looms. Um, these are punch cards from the 1800s. And this was the first human computer interface. I don't know if any of you ever remember back in the day programming these punch cards on mainframes, but this is how we interacted with technology. And it was only for the elite few that could understand it. And then there's this amazing era where digital typewriters started to create these command line interfaces where you could have this direct conversation with technology. But still, you needed to be a programmer or a developer to really know how to have this interface. And you know, back in 1974, 
this gentleman, Tim Mott in Xerox Park, was a sociologist doing research with ordinary folks. Like, how do they want to use computers? And he brought them in and they did some co-creation. And one of the sessions, this one woman said, well, I just wish computers was like going to the office where I've got a desktop and I've got an inbox and I've got some files and I can just copy and paste. And this napkin sketch that Tim wrote back in 1974 became the prototype for the Alto computer that Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak used to launch a whole new generation of computing with the Mac and, and, and beyond. And it was this, this new metaphor, this moment democratized access to technology. We need this moment in banking. We're still in that kind of punch card command line interface era. So I, maybe we can discover a bit of that metaphor together. So now is the moment that I want you to grab your piece of paper and something to draw with because I'm just going to give you 60 seconds, very simple question, to draw an answer to the question of what are your finances like? Are you ready? I'm just going to draw whatever comes to mind. It could be an image. It could be abstract or concrete. It answers the question, my finances are like. Ready? Your mark. Get set. Go. This is where I probably should have planned for some Jeopardy music or something, but you know, we got about 45 seconds left. There's no wrong answer to this activity. All right, we're about halfway done. And I'm not gonna be, able to see all of these, but uh, reach out to me on Twitter, M-A-K-0-S-K-I. I'd love to send me your pictures of your metaphors because I want to see what you're creating. All right, we're in the last 10 seconds. Y'all ready? All right. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, great. So, we did this exact same activity in one of our branches. This is our Halifax branch in Cannon Street in London, and we did it all over the place, but we turned our branches, branches into a design studio, and we actually asked customers kind of a bunch of questions, but then we engaged them and, and had them draw their finances. And I just wanna show you some of the examples that came out. Maybe these are similar to what you just drew yourself. So some people said, you know, my finances are like an endless to-do list. You know, this is almost like that negative feeling of the, the ledger, right? It's kind of difficult. It's all in the past. I don't know if I can even control it. Um, or even an open prison. You know, my finances, I'm just totally trapped. But the gate is open. If I just knew how to make my way out, everything would be okay. Or even take this one. I love this one. My income is a well. The water comes in. And I've got this savings barrel set aside, which is buried and leaking, by the way, and then I've got this pail, which is my wallet. And as I walk over, you know, I, I forget about, you know, my goals sometimes and, you know, my habits aren't always formed. So I'll just buy something extra at the grocery store and I'll go to the movie theater. And by the time I get to the savings barrel, there's nothing left. So these new metaphors are getting us engaged in a new way of thinking. Now, one of the most powerful metaphors that we've looked at is the journey. Now, this woman she uh, did this really amazing sketch with us and some Lego prototyping where she said, you know, I'm, I'm here at the bottom and it's not just me, it's my partner and I want to be to the top. The top is happiness, a home and a hundred thousand pounds saved up. And I just need to know what my options are. How do I get there? So we started looking at this notion of the journey because the ledger is all about the past. We need a metaphor about the future. And we gathered this team together and particularly right there in the middle, Seema Takur is one of our branch consultants. And she um, started working with us in trying to think about ways we could almost kind of recreate a SEMA 2.0 in, in kind of the way we do chatbots and virtual assistants, but also in physical media. So we created this plan and this was kind of a life map and we had the opportunity for folks, folks to put different life moments on there. This is our first really rough prototype, um, but it was amazing because even in our first round, the people that we were working with uh, they loved it so much they wanted to keep it. In fact, one participant said, I want to put this up on my fridge. Now, what banking interface do you know of is so trusted and valued 
that it's put up right next to your family photos on the fridge. And so we kind of knew we were onto something. And when you think about this new metaphor of the journey, it's kind of like where driving was decades ago. Like I had to learn on a road atlas and it was really complicated. You'd have to pull over. And then many of you remember the MapQuest era of turn by turn directions, which revolutionized getting from point A to point B. You know, you could rely on this plan, but God forbid you take a left turn when you're supposed to go right, or you miss that 8.2 miles next direction. And so we're looking now at the GPS and auto rerouting algorithms. And, you know, driving is a much different experience today. Um, and this is where technology and new metaphors can assist us. So, all right, I'm going to wrap up here with some thoughts on how do we using behavioral science and behavioral economics insights. So first of all, we started creating this new design language to unlock everyone's ability to connect with finances and to have strengthened financial well-being. And originally we were looking at these attributes. These are the kind of typical things design teams in banking look like, like how much do you know about finances in terms of literacy? Um, how much time are you able to give to engaging with your finances across, you know, mobile, web, etc.? cetera? Um, what is your access and inclusion? And what about your current state in terms of well-being? And we realized that these variables didn't quite have the habit changing impacts we wanted. So we looked at these four new areas that come from the world of behavioral economics. So these are not going to be unfamiliar to this group, but let me just walk through really quickly um, how we're thinking here. So number one, goal orientation. You know, how many of you have a goal to be physically fit, right? We probably all do. Those of you that have an approach orientation towards goals probably are thinking about, okay, well, here's what I want to accomplish next month. Here's what I'm going to do today. I've got a plan. You know, you take a goal and you break it down into steps that you can accomplish. Those of you that avoid goals are like, yeah, I want to work out someday. I don't know exactly what I'll do, but I'm sure it's going to be awesome. And clearly those that have more of an approach mentality are more likely to form new healthy habits. The second one is conscientiousness. And this one is around, uh, you know, if you think about those that are more impulsive, that are live in the moment and kind of make spontaneous decisions, you know, they're not quite as good with their money as those that are thinking more about the future and conscientious behavior. The other one we look at is optimism. It turns out that those that are, you know, have a more positive outlook on life in general are more likely to actually meet their goals and change habits. And then finally, this came from a professor at the London School of Economics, this idea of locus of control. If you're asked the question, do you feel like you have the power to change things in your life? If you say, yes, I do. I've got the power inside of me. I can do anything. Then that locus goes inside of you. It's internal. If you say, I don't really have power, you know, that's elsewhere, then it's external. So the more that it's internal, the more likely you are to make change. So we started to think about how do we create a system that understands where different customers lie against those principles. So that whether it's a mobile app or a conversation or a branch in-person view, we can adapt our guidance to them. So here's one example. If you are, if you avoid setting goals, well, maybe in our mobile app, this little concept was around, well, let's break it down and let's create into this adaptive interface that says you should spend this much at this frequency for this goal. And you can, of course, tweak any variable, but it just makes it easier for you to be kind of more connected to goals. Or another one is if you're not particularly conscientious, well, let's kind of give you a nudge a couple of weeks before you're likely to go into overdraft by saying, hey, heads up, we got some bills coming up. And actually we use this kind of thinking on our recently with how we address gambling controls. So we've identified that gambling for some is an addiction and that uh, particularly in the wee hours of the night uh, for someone that has a significant portion of their income spent on gambling that, you know, we behavioral scientists have told us that if we actually can break some of these, um, you know, addictive routines by having just a little bit of friction of at least eight minutes, um, or actually eight seconds, um, you can start to bring back some of the rational brain into, you know, thinking about things. So we're not trying to like police whether gambling's okay or not. There's a whole data ethics question there, but we've started to have some really positive impact for those that would otherwise not want to be addicted and, and use our banking interfaces to help them.
So a little snapshot of what we're trying to do. I wish I could show you more. There's so much tinkering in our labs behind the scenes, but um, I encourage all of you on your journey towards bringing together the left and the right brains together to applying technology, hashtag FinTech, with intuition, FinSense, and behavioral science to make some real breakthroughs. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, you know, this is our CTO. And uh, we recently took this photo together and we swapped glasses, which was a nice metaphor on how we need to look through each other's eyes. And for me as a design leader, it's been so powerful to look at the power of technology to really accelerate design and vice versa. Our CTO now is looking at how do we think about empathy as a way of progressing the way that we use technology. And now at the end of the day, it's all about creative confidence, whether you're applying behavioral economics or design. There's a great book out there. Many of you may have known this called Creative Confidence, written by the Kelly brothers who uh, found some of the co-founders of IDEO. And if you don't have time to read it, I'll, I'll leave you with this one thought. Get into a place where you feel just a little bit uncomfortable, just a little out of your zone. For me, that's Pineapple Dance Studios in London with a bunch of 20-something you know, millennials taking a hip-hop dance class. And I do this several times a week because it puts me completely out of my comfort zone. And this is allowing me to just think in a new way. And we're trying to apply this same mentality of how do we nudge people just to that, that next level. It might be a little uncomfortable, but not so uncomfortable so that they can get that dopamine rush of satisfaction when they really get nudged to true prosperity. Thank you so much. Well done, that was absolutely fantastic. And I've got about 20 questions I'd love to ask myself. However, there are some fantastic questions already on Slido. Now it's worth remembering that this is sponsored in part by the B2B Institute. And one of the things we've noticed working with them is that the biases you find within institutions are actually greater than the biases you find within individuals. Yeah. And the great question asked here is, did you encounter resistance as a designer when you first joined the bank? Because it's an interesting thing. Designers traditionally all want to join Apple or Nike. And I always go, yeah, but you've already True. got lots of great marketing thinking in those companies. The impact you can have there is potentially minor, whereas in a bank, that's really talking. How did you find it when you first joined? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, there was a lot of thirst for a new level of empathy and creativity. Because with a bank that cares about helping Britain prosper, there's an openness, but I have to say, not owning a suit and you know, rocking up to headquarters and going to like board meetings, um, I, I definitely look and feel very different. And that sometimes it's, uh, it's tough to you know, move the needle in the way that you would in an apple. But I have to say, the most important thing is that folks are open and they're willing to go on this journey. So you know, it's worth putting up with that imposter syndrome that I feel walking through the halls of Lloyd's not feeling like I quite belong. And a uh, great question also, what are, you, what are you most proud of changing at Lloyd's so far yeah. and indeed in the future? You know, the, the thing I'm most proud of so far has been real-time notifications that are now smart. So, you know, in a transactional banking world, knowing what's happening with your finances has always been key, but giving a little bit of you know, intelligence to those notifications, even just the responses we get when we say, hey, we noticed this bill, which has been regular for the last couple of months, it's a little bit higher than usual. You might wanna, you know, check that out. We get re reactions from folks that are just incredible because they feel like they now have it a, a help to track their finances and they're not alone in doing that. So I think there's a lot more to be done in the real-time notification space. It's super humble. It's not like a Project Aura, but it's really, you know, it impacts people in a very detailed way. I mean, this is something that absolutely fascinates me because when you have a very, very left brain institutional culture, which you tend to find, by the way, in finance, uh, you also find it in engineering and tech. Sure. Uh, and I'm going to qualify the use of the word left brain in a second, by the way, because we've got an angry person on Slido about that. And I'm going to, I'm going to raise that a little bit. Sure, um, sure. They tend to define everything as a kind of mathematical optimization problem, not as a psychological problem. And people with their finances are probably more concerned about certainty and ambiguity avoidance than they are about the pure optimization of wealth. And, and of course, if you're, in a, if you're in a banking culture, that's completely incomprehensible to you at first because everybody around you essentially has the same mental schema for the world. Yeah. 
And one of the things that drives me nuts is that if I put money into my pension, I don't get a text to confirm that more money has gone in. I've got to wait six months for a pension statement. Remember that I paid in money and remember to check. It's, it's never going to happen. OK, this is crazy. And the second thing I always notice is that because it's so difficult to pay a one off payment into a pension, it's a double whammy. So, A, it's what you call goo. You know, mm, it's difficult right, to right. do. But also, because the process is gooey, it also feels weird. And you mm -hmm. instinctively feel, well, if this were a normal thing to do, to top up my pension with an ad hoc amount, they would have made it easy to do. So the fact that this involves me finding a letter and posting a stamp must mean that I'm doing something really weird. So you actually create a double level of goo there. I think. There's so many examples of that, I think, in the finance world of, um, you know, what a designer would say is like thoughtless processes. And I think the, the advantage of having design within the heart of banking is that we can be more conscious because, as you're right, banking thinks often in terms of optimization, but the real innovations in banking are going to come from the heart and from emotions and how people feel about things. Like one example, during the COVID crisis, we called all of our vulnerable customers, you know, our more elderly kind of sheltering at home folks. And the only uh, protocol for the call was, how are you doing? That was it. No upsell, no, you know, what products do you need? And some of our customers like hung up on us because they're like, what bank would do that? <laughs> like, you know, this is a fraud, right? And then, but many of our other customers had a chance to talk about how they're really suffering and we just listened and it like we need more of that kind of interaction to open up the heart in banking because the finances will follow. Uh, just one final comment. Someone has yeah. questioned the use of the left brain, right brain totally. metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, to be honest, one, a metaphor to be useful doesn't have to be true. It right. simply can be useful. Secondly, read the work of Ian McGilchrist. Who is totally. a neuroscientist yeah. who you, you yeah. know this who believes yeah, in yeah. the Yeah, I mean the reality is that it's not dichotomous like that. It's just a useful way to say that in banking they lean with the rational side. The reality is even those who are focused on engineering or tech or banking have lots of creativity. And exactly. designers also have lots of data-driven, you know, rational thinking too. So I totally agree that I, I was very simplistic with that metaphor. No, 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 I, no, no. I, yeah. I'm by and large on your side. That is absolutely fantastic. And now with the third Dan in the row, it's time for me to hand over to uh, Daniel Bennett. Thank you Thanks very so much. Appreciate Dan, it. that was fantastic. Thank you very much, Dan, for what Twitter is calling the sexiest presentation of the day. That was fantastic. Um, we want to tell you a little bit more about um, how you can get more of Nudstock Beyond today. But before that, just like to say that we are at 99% of our charity fundraiser for the Red Cross today. So please, please um, jump on to nudgestock.co.uk forward slash festival dash pack to take us there. We've just gone into the hour of six. We're going on for another well, many more hours today. So let's see how far we can get it. And actually, we've just hit a hundred percent of our target. So thank you, thank you so much for doing that. That's fantastic. Well, let's keep going. So, how you get more of your Nudstock uh, experience so far? This is just the tip of the iceberg today. If you go onto nudstock.co.uk forward slash festival dash pack, you'll see how to get access to our Obehave blog written by our team every week. You'll see our podcast with some of the world's leading psychologists and and great um, people who apply behavioural science talking about their work on there and also access to some more of our case studies in our annual, as well as some extra Nudge Stop webinars in the future as well. So make sure you're on that mailing list to get access to that. Next, to drive us through Nudge Stop, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Sonia Friedrich. Um, Sonia is actually just around the corner from our first host, Sam Tatum, in Australia right now. Um, she employs a team of statisticians, data analysts, and applied behavioral scientists to prove that behavioral interventions work. Today, Sonia was talking about a case from Sweden, and intriguingly, I think it's going to double the viewing figures, it's called Naked Nudges. So we're very, very happy to be introducing to the Nudstock stage, Sonia Friedrich. Fantastic. It's so great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to Nudstock. My name's Sonia Friedrich, and today what I'd like to do is to excite you to think differently about solving problems in business in real time. My team and I work with top 200 companies down to solopreneurs. And today we wanna to share one case study and some insights that came along the way that may be of benefit to you. So let's begin. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to imagine that you are on the board 
or you are the founder or you are part of the executive team of a multi-million dollar business that's based in Sweden. It's a franchise that has 26 franchisees. And for the last 12 months, 11 of those 12 months, you've actually been in decline. In fact, in 11 of those 12 months, you've been losing sales from between 13% and 3% every month. And as a collective, you're trying to work out why are you losing this money and why are you in decline? And the whole group continues to come back to the same reason, that there's a belief that it's from a market downturn. Yet what if it isn't from a market downturn? What if it's from something else, but we've just been unable to see it? Collectively, we haven't been able to see it to date. I want you to now imagine that you are the founder of Naked Juice Bar in Sweden. And you've moved back to Byron Bay. And while you're there, a friend has said, you need to meet with this woman, Sonia Friedrich. She does stuff in behavioral economics. And you wonder what behavioral economics is, but you decide to meet over a coffee. And for some reason over this coffee, you ponder whether or not between the two of you, one, you can solve the problem as why the business is in decline in Sweden. And two, you can turn it back into growth. And so while you're sitting there, what happens is Sonia starts speaking to you about irrational pricing and why it wins. And she starts talking to you about heuristics and biases and what we know about the brain today. Why people buy, why they spend money, why they take risks and how they make choices about things. And all of us who work in the space of behavioral economics, we understand that it's really difficult concept to grasp for people who aren't within it, unless you share some examples, some stories about what's worked and what hasn't in real time. So I'm sitting there and I'm sharing stories with Maria about anchoring and framing and choice architecture, which we know will all impact about why somebody buys. And then I start speaking about the power of decoys. I speak about attraction effects or asymmetrical dominating effects and compromise effects. And it's while I'm having this conversation that this light bulb moment goes on and Maria stops me and she says, I think you may have just worked out while we've been losing sales in Sweden. So she gets excited and I get excited that within days they've actually changed their entire menu. And what they've done is they've taken all of these nudge ideas and they've put it into their new menu. And that's when I start getting scared. And I say, we need to stop. We need to slow everything down. And the first thing we need to do is we need to prove what we're thinking. We need to prove that the downturn has actually been caused by what we think it is. And then instead of doing 20 nudges at once, we need to do one at a time. And we work with my team of statisticians and data analysts. And what we want to do is prove one nudge at a time that it works for your business, because that's how you now build business IP, rather than actually do 20 things at once and then wonder which one worked. And that's what I love about the world of behavioral economics. Everything's measured so we know it really works for the business. So here's one of the team and in one of the franchises in Sweden. And if you've been to Sweden, you've probably seen one of these franchisees in the airport. And if you haven't, next time you're there, please stop in and order something. What I'd also want you to do is just focus on a few of these products here. You can see they sell quite a lot, but all I want you to focus in on is these three cups. These three cups, there's a small, there's a regular, and there's a large. And now I want you to focus in even more. I want you to focus in on this green one, this green small cup. It's called the kid's cup. It's 300 mils. The middle one is 400 mils. And the large one is 550 mils. Now imagine you're running a business and one of your products isn't selling so well. And we've all done this and I've certainly been in situations before where I've done it too. And what happened is when, the, when that product isn't selling, we delete it. But unlike what we often do when we're bringing something new into a business where we pilot it before we bring it in, rarely do we pilot the deletion of a product line. And so what happened was this kid's cup that wasn't selling so well got deleted. And so then there were two cups left. There was the regular and there was the large and the kid's cup was no longer available. So we wanted to determine whether or not removing this kid's cup had an effect on overall sales of the franchise. And we wanted to ask ourselves, ideally, we actually wanted to decide and know that it was causal. Was it correlated coincidence or actually it was none of the above? And so we set ourselves a task in the first instance, and this was our first nudge. Our first nudge was based on something that actually previously already occurred in the business and actually had occurred quite some time ago. 
and we wanted to identify whether or not a reverse effect had occurred. Did this deletion of the kids cup size result in a reverse effect and reduce overall drink sales across the franchise? What a powerful thing to find out if it did. It would mean we had solved the first problem of understanding why there was a decline in the first place. And so what was critical here was understanding the data. In today's world, there's a lot of data that is available electronically, which is fantastic. When we were doing this nudge, it was during a transition time for Naked Juice Bar. They were just going into electronic point of sale, which meant we actually had to get the data manually, not me, their team. And I really give them credit and take my hat off to the team because it took them three months to manually get the data to actually give us enough information that our statistical team could look into and see whether or not there was any relationship whatsoever. And they did it. And so we looked at the data and we said, what's in there? And here's what we found. This little green cup had caused so much in this business that in one of the franchises, it had resulted in a 19% decrease in unit sales. And it was highly statistically significant. In a second franchise, it had resulted in an 11% decline in unit sales as well. And this was also statistically significant. We had deliberately only chosen two experimental stores. We knew that we could actually get the data from those two stores without disrupting the, the entire business. And we could do it in a time frame that seemed possible because we needed to do it manually. And in real time and in real life, there are factors that need to be taken into consideration when we're looking at the implementation and the understanding of nudges. So there was something else going on when, we, when the business deleted this little green cup. Something else unexpected happened. And in, again, in the world of behavioral economics, we always want to be measuring so we can look for unintended consequences. And so, as I mentioned before, there were three sizes. There was a premium blend, there were juices and smoothies. That's the way you could purchase the drinks at Naked Juice Bar. But it turns out premium blends never had a kid's cup. That size never existed when you actually went to purchase a premium blend. You could only ever get a regular or a large. And so when the kid's cup was deleted, it turns out there was an equivalent loss in sales across the premium blends of a 10% decline across the board. And this was an unintended consequence that we didn't think would happen, but it actually piggybacked this deletion. And so it's really powerful to understand what's going on in the entire dynamic of a business. What this also did was change what we were going to do as our second nudge. Because ideally, we wanted to run one nudge in franchise one and another nudge in franchise two and run them in parallel. We wanted a compromise effect in one and an attraction effect in another. So we could learn which one actually gives the best result for the business. Learning this, we realized that what had actually happened was there wasn't a conversion to the other products. We'd lost those customers by deleting the kids cup. So we didn't want to just reintroduce the kids cup because those, those customers are gone. We actually wanted to test something else first and test something else with the adult sizes and see whether or not we could get a behavior change there first and also see whether or not we could turn around this loss of growth. So here was our second experiment. We set out to prove adding a third option to an existing choice set of two for a select segment, as I mentioned, adults only, not the kids ones, would actually affect buying patterns. And here was the design we ended up with. Now this can look really, really simple. It can look simple that we've now just got three cups. And I can assure you that a lot of the nudges in behavioral economics look simple, but the thinking behind them is really, really complex. And it's the thinking behind them that makes them successful. Because we need to take into consideration the data. We need to take in consideration the financial reality of a business of what actually gives them a net profit and increases their gross margin, not just put three cups out there and see what happens. In this instance, we also needed to take into account how many meal, meals we fill each cup with, because every meal is actually a cost to the business. And so we could factor that in. So there were a lot of calculations going on behind the scene as we decided to do these three um, these three cups and at those prices. And as we mentioned, there was no kids cup in this second nudge. So what happened when we did introduce that? Let's have a look at these results. 
we did uh, an analysis six weeks prior to the introduction and an analysis six weeks post. And we were really limited by time here. We were getting towards the end of the year when holidays were coming in, Christmas wasn't too far away. And we realized that if we didn't run this experiment prior to when we did, we would be waiting till March the following year and it would delay the outcomes by a minimum of five months. But look at these amazing results. What we saw was an 8.2% increase in revenue and 4.8% increase in units sold. Now, we did also find that it wasn't statistically significant. We did not run this for long enough period of time for us to get that significance. The client, as you can imagine, actually didn't want us to go on with the measurement. They now wanted to roll this out across their 26 franchises and actually see what else they could get as a result in the franchise. And so they went on and did that. And they've gone on and run additional nudge experiments. And they've actually still got now the um, three adult size cups. And they have introduced a kids cup with some of the uh, products that are sold. So thanks again for having me. We love to work with everyone, anywhere. And so I'd love to hear from you if we can help you. And good luck for everybody with what you learned through Nudge Stock 2020, because it's such an amazing event for us to all be a part of across the globe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia. That was absolutely fascinating. I would also like to remind you about today of the, the very important cause that we're raising money for. Everyone here at Nudstock and, and our partners have worked very hard to bring today for you all Nudstock into your living room for free. So if you can, we'd love to encourage you to give whatever you can uh, to this very valuable cause of helping people in difficult times around the world. And if you want to, you can go to nudstock.co.uk forward slash festival dash pack to do so. And in true Nudstock style, we have helped you with some framing ideas here, just to give you a few anchors. Um, one of the new ones we're introducing right now is that if you still haven't showered today, then that's a guaranteed £20 donation or whatever currency you are in. Coming up next, we're absolutely thrilled to be introducing to you another Nudstock veteran, Professor Paul Dolan. He's an expert in happiness. He's written books, bestsellers, Happiness by Design and Happily Ever After. He's the head of department, or as he's just been saying, a very, very, very bloody busy head of department for the LSE's Psycho Psychology and Behavioural Science Department. He's here to talk about some interesting topics that might make raise a few, few hairs. So thank you so much. It's my pleasure to introduce to the stage yet again, Professor Paul Dolan. So thank you very much, Dan. Thank you very much, everybody, for being there. Um, Yet again, I'm not sure I kind of like that really, yet, yet again to the stage. It's a really weird stage, isn't it? So I, I really hope there is an audience out there and I hope um, some of what I say might prove insightful for you. I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about um, COVID-19. I'm sure you've not heard anything about that over the last um, two or three months. Um, in response to COVID-19, we basically had two extreme positions that could have been adopted, um, one of which was to do nothing at all. And the other one is to lock everybody down until we find a vaccine. Now, as far as I'm aware, I don't know anybody who's, um, who's thought that either of those extremes is a sensible policy solution. So necessarily, then, we're navigating our way through some quite significant trade-offs. Um, and I think what I want to do in, in about 10 minutes or so today is to talk about some of those important trade-offs and, and also maybe ask the question of why we've not been able to talk so openly about them. Um, I really should be clear that I don't think anybody can claim to know how best to respond to COVID-19. Um, and of course, those trade-offs raise very difficult ethical challenges um, that no single perspective could ever claim to know how to best resolve. And so um, the pandemic, which is clearly not just a health pandemic, it's an economic and social one too, um, involves trade-offs across all aspects of human well-being and welfare. And so it's absolutely vital that the decisions are made by including experts from a range of different disciplines, from education, from mental health, from economics, palliative care, as well as epidemiologists and virus control experts. And I think that's, that's why I think I've continually argued throughout, as many as many others have too, of course, this whole pandemic, is that we need different perspectives around the, the actual table to, um, to, make, to, 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 to ultimately consider these various kinds of trade-offs. Because um, if we can't agree on the outcomes, we can at least ensure that the processes by which those outcomes come about ensure that every voice relevant is heard. 
Um, so against that background, I, I want to consider two important trade-offs. Um, they're important trade-offs. They're, they're also close to my own intellectual heart as well. Um, I want to first of all talk briefly about the trade-off between immediate mortality risks and lifetime inequalities. And then I want to talk about the trade-off between life expectancy and life experience. Um, now, we've, I think we've known from a very early stage from the, from the cruise ships onwards that younger people are at very, very low risk of adverse outcomes associated with COVID-19. Um, of the 40,000 or so deaths that we've had in the UK so far, less than 1%, so about 400 have been under the age of 40. Um, there's been about 4,000 deaths in the time since the first, 4,000 deaths of people under 40 um, in the time since COVID-19 first hit the UK, since we recorded our first death. So that's 400 of those 4,000 deaths have been due to COVID-19. So basically you have a very, very small risk of dying that has increased by a very small amount um, in the 10 weeks or so since, uh, 10 or 12 weeks now since uh, the first death was recorded. So, so um, I, think, I think that's important. And it's interesting that that hasn't been, to my mind, I think featured so prominently in the discussions about the impact of COVID-19 when we've looked exclusively at mortality risks, really, um, but but haven't paid as much attention as we might otherwise to who experiences those mortality risks. So everyone believes in fairness. Everyone has a principle of equality. Everyone believes in justice. The question is, equality of what? Um, I think there's a powerful egalitarian principle, um, which you might call the fair innings argument, which is that everyone's entitled to some normal span of health. And anyone falling short of achieving that has, in some sense, been cheated. Um, so that means that the more you fall short of the fair innings, the more you have been cheated. So as we kind of navigate our way through um, the various types and extents of lockdown and social distancing measures, um, which may continue for actually some time yet, right, um, it becomes ever more important that policymakers um, not only give us estimates of which of the population subgroups will die early, but how early? Um, because as, as I say, the, it, it, it appears quite striking to me that we haven't had as much of a conversation about the fair innings argument that, that you know, essentially to die, to die young is, uh, is, is to have been cheated out of your um, lifetime. So um, in addition to that, I think I'm not, I'm not going to spend any time on this. I'm actually conscious of time. I want to get into a bit of a QA and a if I, if I have time to. Um, since we're all going to die at some point, I mean, that's actually a fact of, um, I think that's one of the, you know, we talk about death and taxes being the two certainties of life. I think it becomes really important that we have a conversation about the process of dying, not just, not just when we die, but how. Um, and I think that COVID-19 presents us as we move forward with an, with an opportunity to, to have a much more open and frank conversation about that. Um, I want to then just turn to the second of the trade-offs, which is the one between life experience and life expectancy. And I think it's pretty clear around the world that we've paid enormous amount of attention to mortality risks. Um, uh, we see daily updates of the number of deaths. Um, the, you see comparisons being made across the world about who's you know, had lower death rates, who's had higher ones. Um, and that's important. Of course, it's important. I mean, it'd be crazy for anyone to say otherwise. But since every policy decision is necessarily involving trade-offs, it's important that those deaths are played in are uh, that those deaths are placed in context, even in the context of the number of people dying generally. I actually hadn't realized until March this year that about 1,600 people die every day in the UK uh, anyway. And it's, it's, it's not impossible to conceive of a situation where policymakers present us with not just mortality risks and not just for whom uh, and when, but actually the whole myriad of other consequences that are following from policy responses. So um, we know that 
the policy responses are uh, affecting mental health, they're affecting employment, inequalities. In education is, is enormous. I mean, we're now starting to see some evidence suggesting that, you know, a decade's worth of inequality reduction is being offset in six months of kids not being at school. And it, it's, it's interesting to me, at least, <laughs> in the very least, that we, that we haven't had a fuller discussion of that. Um, and how the consequences, particularly for children, I mean, that's why I draw attention to kids being off school, um, who have now been off school, what, since mid, mid-March, and there's no prospect of, um, of most of them returning at least until September, and maybe not even then in, a, in any kind of way that would, would, would be considered a conducive learning experience. Um, I am fundamentally concerned about the impact that that's having, not on just educational attainment and the inequalities in education, but on the social development of children. And it's it's inter- it just it's 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 interesting and quite puzzling to me that that hasn't been, we haven't been able to have that at the forefront of the of the conversations about how to respond to COVID nineteen, um, whilst we we have had um, a very clear exposition of the mortality risks and the number of people dying. So I kind of I wanted to um, I think I think there's nothing that I've said in there that's controversial. So I guess the interesting question then is why there might be some controversy around talking about these kinds of trade offs. And um, I think from a behavioural perspective, I think we we as a society, as individuals, as people having conversations, um, find it easier to deal in absolutes. It's much easier when you don't have to talk about opportunity costs and trade offs, which is the, the mantra of econ you can talk about things really fundamentally mattering and it, and it enables you, I think, to signal how much you care. It enables you to, to, to make statements of, you know, following the science of being very much concerned about mortality risks, it enables you to signal how much mortality risks matter to you. Um, it also makes you more likable. I think if you start, if you start thinking in terms of trade-offs and opportunity costs, then you kind of, I don't know, just somehow, not as decent or a, or a nicer person as if you signal how much um, you care about about these really fundamental attributes of life and death. Um, I think it's also simpler. Um, it's it, it's so much easier to deal in absolutes. And, and uh, in um, happy after in happy ever after, which Dan kindly uh, mentioned at the introduction to my talk, um, I talk about positive har- uh, harms that might come possible harms. That might come from social from social narratives from from rules about how we should live rules of thought and action that help make a complicated world uh, easier for us and help us make sense of that world and if we look to these narratives to clues or for clues about how to live then we're given a coherent path to follow um not only does it give us a coherent path to follow it also gives us a coherent path by which to judge other people so when when people question narratives then we can help them we we can look scornfully at them and we can you know sort of judge them quite harshly individually and and also at a social level so um in in happy ever after i talk about nine narratives and um one of those is uh, in fact health and here's the idea that you that you have a responsibility to to not only maximize your own health but also to maximize the health of the people who's act, who you're acting on on the behalf of and I think that that the responses to COVID-19 I think for me at least have shown just how powerful that narrative is of course I wrote happy 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 ever after long before I any anyone knew we were going to be experiencing a pandemic but it 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 draws attention to how much we we value life expectancy over life experience and it and it kind of drives the demands for for um, stringent measures um, it also it also makes people like me nervous about about saying whether some of those policy responses weren't um, in fact social welfare and enhancing when we consider all of the other myriad of impacts that those policy responses have had. So um, I think again it's not a controversial thing to say, but of course the preservation of life matters. But it's also important that we don't forget that we have to live life too. Um, so I think I, I think I'm going to conclude now. I think that was about. I said I'd take about ten or twelve minutes to um, say what I wanted to. I think that's as far as I'd like to get to, Rory. And uh, maybe you've got some things you might like to pick up on. Well, 
This strikes me as incredibly interesting because there seem to be areas of discussion where uh, any kind of utilitarian approach is viewed with visceral horror. And I, I often quite enjoy experimenting uh, with policy positions or opinions, which are perfectly easy to justify, but which everybody else finds repugnant. So one of the things I often say is, I prefer my daughters took up smoking to taking up cycling in London. And basically everybody vomits a little bit into their mouth. And my argument is, look, if they die at 68, it's a bummer. But if they die at 23, it's a complete tragedy. There are other interesting things why, you know, so people who in Engage in, for example, drug taking, uh, which is a health risk, are absolutely excoriated, whereas people who climb Everest are treated like heroes, okay? Uh, whereas they're both, actually, the Everest climbing is more dangerous, undoubtedly, okay? And then the third one, I suppose, would be occasionally just to scandalize people, say that the NHS is a monstrous redistribution of wealth from the young to the old. Uh, which, if you think about it, it, is, you know, essentially people like Dan, who are paid less than me and have less wealth than me, are essentially funding, you know, the healthcare of an old fat bloke like me in 10 years time. And yet, when you say these things, which are kind of objectively true, essentially, you feel, okay, this argument ain't gonna go anywhere. There's a traditional one, by the way, you could make the point that there are three things. There's expectation of future life years, which declines when you get older. There's the fact that if you've made it to 83, you've kind of lucked out anyway, because you've had 83 years of high quality life. There's a third factor, which is that um, if you think about it, if you're a parent and you die in your 50s and you have children who are 12, that is in second order effects, inordinately more of a more of a tragedy than if you die when your kids are 25. OK. Yeah. Okay, so, so there are quite. So I, I was on a longevity group. What I couldn't so me, understand. I can't, I, I can't retain everything. All, all Sorry. You're saying. Okay, I'll, I'll pass over you. So yeah. let me, let me, let me, let me, let me tr try and deal with at least uh, two or three of the points you made. So I want to be clear about the fair innings. What the what the ethical principle that sits underneath it is. It's it's it is true that you may wish to give greater priority to younger people over older people because the younger people have more to gain. So that would be a utilitarian argument. Um, so a 40 year old dying has lost about 42 years of life expectancy, an 80 year old dying has lost about nine. But the fair innings argument is, is a retrospective accounting for what you've already had and not only what you're about, not even what you're about to get. So um, if you were to um, imagine a choice between a 40 year old who would live for another nine years and an 80 year old who would live for another nine years, the utilitarian calculus would say that they should get equal value. The prioritarian calculus of the fair innings would say that you would treat the younger person over the older one because the older one has had more. And, and, and I think that's part of what, when, when I've done social preference work in this area, which I did in an earlier life as a health economist, um, that social preference is actually felt very strongly by most people and especially older people um, it's actually often the older people that will talk about the fair innings um, and uh, as I say citizen citizen preferences in calmer colder states suggest the prioritarianism for younger over older people um, let me then deal with the second point I think was you said about um, risk taking in relation to taking drugs or climbing mountains um, and I completely agree with you I mean I think there's nothing I mean what do you what what ought to we what ought we to judge the impact of our actions on well on our own um, uh, own well-being and on the well-being of those affected by our decisions and so substantively you would want to look at the full flow of impact from climbing mountains compared to taking drugs and it's entirely plausible that taking that that, that climbing everest is is much more harmful for individuals and for social welfare but it might not be and i think maybe one of the reasons why we might have this this moral judgment is not always bad um, is that actually by and large people that may have gone out and explored and taken risks in ways such as that would be like climbing Everest would be doing something that was better for society in the long term than those who took you know that those who took heroin and so on so it might be that some of the moral judgments which we would want to cleanse some of our choices on the basis of actually contain something substantively um, that, that actually contains something substantively rational in them. 
I think there is something interesting there. There's a great book, The Elephant in the Brain, by uh, Kevin Simler and Robin Hanson. <coughs> and some some of the root of this must lie in evolutionary psychology, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, because we have very, very strong instincts, not only to care for the sick, but to actively intervene. What is interesting is I was on a sort of longevity commission. Now, if you'd been on a commission about poverty, it would have been axiomatic that the first people to look at are the very, very poor, okay? You know, you don't worry about someone who's, you know, generally you you, you worry about that more than you worry about someone who's, uh, you know, un unable to pay for the second jacuzzi, as it were. And yet one of the strange things about the Longevity Commission is it didn't really say, before we do anything else, we should look at the causes of really premature death. Yeah. And focus on those. And of course, what's interesting about it is that de <clears throat> depending on your life stage, what you need to focus on uh, is very different. I mean, actually, between the ages of 20 and 40, mental health is probably the greatest risk to you. Uh, suicide. Nassim Taleb always argued, don't smoke and don't travel in helicopters is about the most relevant advice. And yet the health advice that's being given to the young is really health advice that's appropriate or far more pertinent to the old. Yeah, but also I think this is why I think the perspective taking is really important. So it's not just perspectives of different groups and different characteristics, but actually it probably also means different ages. I mean, if you think about if you think about most most of the policy makers, I would imagine that most of the decisions are being made of by people in their fifties, probably, um, who it's probably a time when you might be most fearful of death. Um, and and so it's kind of interesting that it's just I, I think it's an important procedural point that oh. we that we incorporate different perspectives in the decision making process, which will include um, views of younger and and older people. I mean, I think it's it's really important that a lot of these conversations as we move out of lockdown and what we do about lockdown measures include conversations with older people. Um, we need to find out. I think there's a there's, there's often a judgment that's made about, or an expectation that's made about other people about how either what they do think or what they ought to think. And I think that's why narratives are so important. Is that not only do we make assumptions about what other people think, we 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 think we 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 know what they ought to, even if they don't. <laughs> And that, and interesting about the, the narrative about relative age, so that one of the most extraordinary behavioural sort of biases really over the last 20 years was the presentation of rising property prices as a good news story. And that suggested that, in a sense, the news media were dominated by people aged 50 plus who, and economics as a profession, is dominated by people aged 50 plus who already own a home. To anybody under yeah. 40, the same thing was a catastrophe, not a good yeah. news story and it's why, at all. It's, it's, it's also why I'm just so, I'm, I just want to keep mentioning the kids thing, because, you know, we do, we've got lots of uncertainty about virus transmission rates. We've got lots of uncertainty about lots of things moving forward. One thing we can be pretty certain of is that around 700,000 children are at home when school, where school for those 700,000 children is the best place for them to be, the safest place for them to be, the place they get most attention, the place they get cared for, the place they get nourished and fed. Um, it just feels, you know, there's something wrong with where we've got to when the priorities of the children have been so neglected. I think that's really, I've got a great question here from Aidan Watts, which is relevant to your good innings point, which is, yeah. has our frame of reference of a good innings become too optimistic? Yeah, it's a super question. I don't know. I think we we we're almost to the point at which I mean, one one of the things that COVID nineteen may have done is given us a a sort of wake up call, a sense of the mortality that we that we face. That actually, you know, there are things that are beyond our control. Sometimes, I mean, of course, you can think about ways in which we can control it. But I mean, there are things that come along that knock us off this path to living forever. Um, I think that maybe we've sort of got this idea, and as you see people in very, you know, the very, very affluent who are engaging in all sorts of activities to try to prolong their, their lives to 150 or something, that we, that we kind of may have lost sight of the fact that we should be more accepting of the fact that we're going to die, which is why I think that the process of dying becomes so important. Um, the, we, you know, that we, we are quite rightly fearful of the manner in which we die. And, you know, COVID-19, from, from what I can tell, is a really awful death. Um, and so, and so it's that really that, that, that for me would be the way we should be paying much more attention to is kind of the way in which we die and not just, not just, ha you know, ha not just when we die. And one great question from Anonymous as well. 
is the very act of talking trade-offs. And a fascinating thing, uh, mm. I, I, was from, I completely failed to notice the idea that the very phrase herd immunity would cause a scandal. And that's, of course, because I was familiar with the phrase and I knew that was the standard phrase used. Whereas to people who'd never encountered it before, the use of the word herd just seemed like anathema. And there's this great question, I think, um, from Anonymous here, which is when we talk about trade-offs, are we basically violating this care, harm, moral foundation because the very idea of talking about a trade-off makes you look like a calculating bastard? That's absolutely correct. I think that's right. That person is absolutely spot on. I think that you... You, you, you set yourself up for, for being someone who, I don't know, in some way doesn't care. Because if you, if, you, yeah. if you kind of present things in absolutes, you're signaling very clearly that this is important. Um, and, and I think there is some sense in which we do judge uh, people less well if they're, if, they're, if they're willing to engage in the more complex, complicated discussion of opportunity costs and trade-offs. I, I always remember the politician John Redwood, who was considered a Vulcan, and the fascinating thing with him, he's a former McKinsey consultant, I think. And if you put him in front of an audience of economists, he was basically the most intelligent person in the world. But if you put him in front of the public, he came across as this weird, you know, depersonalized calculating machine. And in politics, of course, the, the blend of logos and pathos has massively shifted, I think, in terms of pathos, mm. which kind of bothers me a bit. I'm terribly, terribly sorry to wrap there, but congratulations, I think, Anonymous for spotting something absolutely critical. We're now going to move into a kind of video role. But, Paul, thank you enormously. That was absolutely fantastic. Rory, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Always a joy. And if you're thinking of climbing Everest, consider maybe drugs instead. OK, thanks. Welcome back. Just to clear up a little thing just then, um, Rory was saying that you should climb Everest and not do drugs, just, just in case anyone heard, heard that rug, rug at the end. Uh, we are absolutely delighted to be in hour seven of the Nudstock Marathon Festival broadcast today. So we're not quite at the halfway point. That will come in about, about 40 minutes, but we are, are nearly at the halfway point. So if you've enjoyed today, um, you'll have known that this, can't, this type of event can't happen without the help of partners. And we have several on board today. We have the B2B Institute, which is a wonderful think tank funded by LinkedIn. We also have the creative online learning company, 42 Courses, who today are offering a discount on their behavioral economics course. Just type in nudgestock2020 at 42courses.com. And of course, we have many friends of Nudgestock that also helped today happen, not least the wonderful production company, Kenora, who are behind the scenes making sure that this whole thing happens, pulling the strings. I'm delighted now to welcome to the Nudstock stage 
a man um, who you're going to find absolutely wonderful. Um, he's the world. Uh, the world's comedians are fantastic psychologists, but the world's psychologists can also be fantastic comedians. Um, he's been looking at how, how, why we find what makes this thing so funny for over a decade. He's the director of the Humor Research Lab, and he has a podcast called I'm Not Joking. I'm delighted to introduce to the Nudstock stage, Pete McGraw. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on, on where you are. It's 7 a.m. Uh, my time in Hollywood, California. I think it's best that I uh, start with the bad news. Uh, well, there's actually a couple of pieces of bad news. First one is I have yet to have Rory on I'm Not Joking. That needs to happen at some point uh, when we can get into the same room. The, the other piece of bad news is I am not going to be as funny as you want me to be. Um, and that is uh, for some, some obvious reasons, as you probably have figured out from the pandemic, Zoom is not the ideal context uh, for comedy. Although the one good advantage is that you can uh, that you can drink in these meetings versus in your actual uh, meetings at work. Now, the good news is that I am not going to ask you to be funnier at work. And the reason I'm not going to do that is, uh, is first of all, it's not really the best solution to most of your professional problems. Although being funny may be useful for your brands at times, um, and it may be useful for some people on occasion, but really the problem is, is if I tell the world, if I tell 30,000 nudge stock attendees to go forth and be funny, we need to be worried about that guy. You know, and that guy is, is typically a guy. Um, and he is, uh, he is often uh, a middle-aged guy like me. And, uh, and he hasn't been out on a date in a while, uh, also uh, like me. Um, that guy'd be lucky to get a speaking gig at Nudge Stock. Um, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to ask you to think funny. That is, to think differently. To think like the world's funniest people. Now, the reason to do that is that most of our pressing problems are going to be solved with a bit of creativity and innovation. So let me step back for a moment and talk about how I got to this argument. Uh, so, so I started off as kind of a run-of-the-mill run behavioral economist before they were being called behavioral economists. Um, so now, about 12 years ago, I was giving a dry, esoteric uh, talk at, uh, at an American university. For those of you who are not familiar with academia, you'll, you'll get invited to a university, you'll get put up in a hotel, you'll be given a nice meal, you get to meet with all the faculty, and they'll kind of poop on your ideas for about an hour, hour and a half as part of a talk. The talk that I was giving was on religious marketing and how people find religious marketing to be um, at times uh, morally wrong. And I gave a, a kind of provocative example of a, um, of a moral violation in, in religious marketing. This, this church in Tampa, Florida had raffled off in order to get people to go to their winter retreat, a yellow H2 Hummer SUV. And my audience chuckled at this idea and a hand went up in the back of the room, and, uh, and I was asked the most important question of my professional life, and that is, you just pointed out that moral violations cause anger and disgust, and yet we're laughing. Why? Um, I went back to Boulder, Colorado, my home university, puzzled over that question, um, de designed some answers to it, started publishing more dry esoteric papers, and then one day, was approached by a, a journalist and uh, I ended up finding myself standing on a, on a stage at a divey bar in Denver, Colorado telling jokes and bombing badly. And it was that experience that led me to write my first book uh, called The Humor Code, A Global Search for What Makes Things Funny, where you travel around the world sort of cracking the humor code. So I clowned with Patch Adams in the Amazon jungle, I went to Palestine to look at, at humor where you least expect it. Spent time in green rooms with uh, Japanese comedians to figure out those crazy Japanese game shows. Um, and, and as along the way, I just really figured out 
a lot about the craft of comedy and realize, yes, these comedians create a lot of value for us, but we can learn from the way they create that value. So my, rec my most recent book called Stick to Business um, really brings together my day job teaching uh, MBAs and my night job decoding comedy to present these lessons. So um, there's like 21 lessons in the book. Uh, Rory tells me I can only do two. So let's just jump into those two uh, right now. So as I said, I, I want people to think funny. That is to, to try to emulate the practices and perspectives of these, these creative geniuses. So one of those places that you can see this is in a comedy 101 technique called the reversal. So in chapter one, I talk about reverse it. And so comedians think in reverse. So they think in reverse in terms of their punchlines. So for example, the, the king of the one-liners, Henny Youngman, has a quip that said that when I, uh, when I read about the dangers of drinking, I stopped and everybody expects reading. I mean, excuse me, everybody expects drinking and you get reading, right? So when I read about the dangers of drinking, I see so you can tell I'm not a comedian and also that it's first thing in the morning for me right now. When I read about the dangers of drinking, I stopped reading. You can also find reversals in the premises for comedic movies, TV shows, et cetera. So the, the, the movie Trading Places with Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy, the characters, you know, high status, low status person trades places. In Amy Schumer's Trainwreck, it is a reverse rom-com. So in the, in the movie, the Amy Schumer character plays the, the sort of stereotypically male character, right? So rom-coms are boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl back. In this case, the girl is a boy and hilarity ensues. So um, thinking in reverse can help overcome the status quo bias. I'm sure this has been a topic that's come up over and over again, the dangers of the status quo and the difficulties of overcoming it. But one of the beautiful things about thinking in reverse is not only does it over help overcome the status quo bias, when you do overcome it, it puts you in a completely different space. It puts you far, far away from, from everyone else. And that is because most people don't think in reverse. So I'll give you an example of this. So suppose you're two Brooklyn-based entrepreneurs and you're looking to compete with Apple and Samsung in the smartphone market. I mean, that's a pretty tall order. How do you outsmart Apple? Well, these two entrepreneurs thought in reverse. They didn't come up with a smarter phone. They came up with the dumb phone. And so the light phone two, AKA the dumb phone, exceeded its funding goal on Indiegogo by 600%. Right. This is a phone that is designed not for people who want to be more connected, it's for people who want to be less connected. And it offers just the very basics, navigation, phone calls, texting, an alarm, and so on. And so they've carved out an interesting niche by thinking in reverse. Another way that you can think about uh, the reversal is this idea of turning bugs into features. And so this is something that comedians do all the time. So they, they for example, often start their stand-up comedy sets with a little bit of self-deprecation, pointing out how they're too tall, they're too short, they're too hairy, they're too bald, they're too skinny, they're too fat. Whatever it is that's wrong with them, they use as a way to create comedy, to create likability, to create accessibility, to be able to critique themselves. And when they can critique themselves, then they can critique the world, world around them. So this idea of turning a bug into feature is a really useful way, I think, to think in reverse. Um, I'll give you one example of this uh, that you can find in the business world. So the Canadian cough syrup company Buckley's uh, was like number nine in the marketplace. And as you can imagine, if you're the number nine mar uh, uh, cough syrup in a marketplace, you are struggling. Well, Buckley's had a problem. And one of the problems besides being number nine is that their cough syrup tasted awful truly awful. So what do you do? You've got this awful tasting cough syrup, you're number nine in the marketplace. Well, you could change the formula, you could dump a bunch of sugar and cherry flavor in there. Um, or you could do what Buckley's did, 
which is to start a campaign where they point out it tastes awful and it works. And they really leaned into this idea, right? It's not that it tastes awful um, and it works, but the underlying message there is it works because it tastes awful. That is, medicine is not supposed to taste good. And when you have a virus that you want to murder in your body, you want the strongest medicine that you can have. And so they leaned into this with things like not new and not improved. Uh, our largest size is 200 milliliters because any larger would be cruel and so on and, and create a really fun campaign catapulting themselves to number one in the marketplace in, in Canada. They were later acquired by a big pharmaceutical company for an undisclosed amount of money. The last uh, version of this is something that I'll give you for your own toolkit. So thinking in reverse is, is, not a, is not something that we naturally do. And so sometimes we have to force ourselves to do it. So when I work with companies um, that are trying to innovate, one of the things that we can do is a, brain, a special brainstorming task that I call shitstorming. And so think about the challenges of a typical brainstorming task, right? So you're supposed, to, you're supposed to have wild ideas and not hold back and not criticize ideas. And yet people always hold back and they don't give wild ideas. Um, and frankly, they don't really have much fun. And it's hard to be creative if you're not really in a positive mood and having a good time. And so with shitstorming, your goal is to brainstorm truly terrible ideas, like the worst possible ideas. Now, this is great. And first of all, because it's a great warm up for any sort of, of innovation task, because it is a lot of fun to shitstorm. Second of all, you can't really be criticized, right? So someone could go, that idea is not so bad. That's not a bad critique to receive. And then the beautiful thing is on occasion, someone comes up with an idea in an attempt to come up with a bad idea that someone says, wait, hold on, that's so crazy, it might actually work. And so um, this shitstorm ta shit shitstorming task is a very fun, sometimes incredibly useful task, but it's certainly a way to step away from the status quo because of uh, your ability to think in reverse. So the second lesson I call create a chasm. This is in the third chapter of Shtick to Business. And so in my MBA class, I, I do this exercise. I'll do it with you very quickly right now. So I, um, I present my students this customer service, to me, customer satisfaction figure, right? So it's a very simple figure. So on the x-axis is from love to hate. And on the uh, y-axis is a percentage of respondents. And you see two brands here, brand A and brand B. So um, I asked my students, which brand do they want to manage, brand A or brand B? And you could see, you know, some, some stark differences between the two. So brand B, no one loves, no one hates, everybody's sort of in the middle. And, and brand A, people either love it or hate it. And this is a spirited debate. Some students want A and some students want B. And I always make the case for brand A. And that is that brand A is like a comedian. That is, it has a group of people who, who love it. Um, and one of the beautiful things about comedians is all they care about is their audience and whether the audience in front of them is laughing or not. And they know that in order to make that audience laugh, they have to risk making another audience not laugh. They create a chasm. And so in a world that wants hot tea, or iced tea, if you serve them warm tea, in order to try to make everyone happy, you make no one happy. And brand B is warm tea, okay? And so the benefit of brand A is you have customers who love you. That is, they're loyal, they're less price sensitive, they engage in positive word of mouth. They don't even just and when they do complain, they complain because they're trying to help you out. And the evidence is that these sort of polarizing brands are, um, are often uh, more stable, especially in, in sort of tumultuous times. So if you think about it, some of the world's biggest, best brands are 
like brand A. They're like comedians. You love them or hate them. For example, you ask someone, do you like Starbucks? Oh my God, I love Starbucks. Really? Why do you love Starbucks? Oh, well, there's a Starbucks on every corner. And whether I'm in Chicago or Cusco or Cairo, I can get my, my Frappuccino. And uh, ask someone else, do you like Starbucks? Oh my God, I hate Starbucks. Really? Why? Well, there's a Starbucks on every corner, and whether you're in Chicago or Cusco or Cairo, you get exactly the same thing. And they have these stupid drinks like Frappuccinos. I just want an old school, you know, cappuccino. So um, if you think about it, like, well, in order to understand why comedians are so interested in creating a chasm, you have to understand what makes things funny more generally. And the work that we've done in the Humor Research Lab suggests that the things that are funny are things that are wrong yet okay, things that are threatening yet safe, or what we call benign violations. So, so this, is, this is a visual version of the benign violation theory. And so what you're doing as a comedian or as someone else who's, who's pursuing laughs is you're looking for that sweet spot between wrong and okay, or benign and violation. Now, the thing about the um, benign violations is that they are wholly determined by the perceptions and values and culture of the audience. That is that you can have the very same joke. First of all, jokes fail in two ways. They can be too boring, they can be too benign, or they can be offensive. They can be completely wrong. But the problem is, but the very same joke can make one person laugh, hit that sweet spot right here in the middle, or can create boredom or offense in, in three different people, which suggests that targeting is paramount to comedians. Comedians actually understand segmentation and targeting better than most brands do. They recognize that in order to make people laugh, or in the case, thrill them, with regard to a product, you have to understand what their values are, what their beliefs are, what their needs are that's there. And so sometimes you find this working, right? You know, I live, I'm living in California right now. I'm on sabbatical. Lots to like about California, beaches, mountains, deserts, big cities, country, etc. There's, there's a lot to like. But imagine you're in Nebraska, right? You know, you're in Nebraska. Well, Nebraska understands that, uh, that they're not for everyone. And they were willing to actually say that in their recent change of their state motto, which is Nebraska. Honestly, it's not for everyone. You know, a bit of, a bit of outstanding marketing uh, while also being a little bit cheeky there too. So um, I'll give you one last example of this and then give you an implication before I wrap up. So, um, Obviously, gyms, uh, you know, for the most part are closed right now. I'm looking forward to them opening up again. One of the, the more fascinating gyms in my neighborhood is called Barry's Boot Camp. Um, so Barry's Boot Camp is a high-intensity training. I know there's, there's some in London, New York. Uh, prior to the pandemic, they were, they were growing like crazy. And it's, but it's not because Barry's works. I mean, Barry's does work. There's, there's hard runs on the treadmill and, and calisthenics and weights in the, in the fitness room. Um, but there's lots of alternatives to Barry's. Why is it that Barry's is so popular? Especially Barry's is popular with the, with the, the kind of celebrity, young, beautiful crowd. So Jake Gyllenhaal works out there. Some of the Kardashians work out there and so on. Well, I went to go see. I went down the street and I went to Barry's. The fascinating thing about Barry's, first of all, is the volume is crazy loud. It's like date, it's like it's like working out in a nightclub. It's so loud. I went out to the front desk and asked if they had earplugs, and they did. And they gave them to me. And I was the only old fart in the place wearing them. The second thing is the room is bathed in red light. So it's it's like you are working out in the red light district in Amsterdam. And, the, and it's a red light district for a reason, because when you're in red light, you look fabulous. Like your skin looks great. It's amazing. And, um, 
And it's so, it looks so good. And people work out. And the men will take their shirts off in the middle of class and work out. People are practically naked in the class. So as you can imagine, not everybody finds this appealing. Um, but if Barry's turned off the red lights, turned down the volume, and, um, and made it like a more normal place, then I would be happy, but Jake Gyllenhaal wouldn't be happy. So Barry serves hot tea. Um, they're not out there serving warm tea. They're behaving like a comedian. They're behaving like a brand that polarizes. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up right now, but the last thing that I wanna say is there's an implication for you and your business, which is when you look at customer satisfaction, you want to look at figures. And the reason why you, know, you want to look at figures is because in this figure, brand A and brand B both have exactly the same customer satisfaction score. They both get a three on this, uh, on this scale. But what really matters is the frequencies, is the distribution, not the average. And so, um, so stop throwing away data and looking at averages for customer satisfaction look at those distributions because you want people who love you most of all. And with that, I will wrap up and, uh, and say hello to Rory. Hi, Rory. Hello, what a fantastic pleasure. Um, I'll just very quickly, uh, it echoes something I say in my book, which is don't solve for average. And I occasionally use phrases like, nobody gets an endorphin rush from mid-market retail. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we get a thrill from an extravagance and we get a thrill from a bargain, but the middle doesn't really do it. Just a little question for me. If you, like, I think me and my team tend to think backwards, okay, A, yes. humor helps. Yeah. B, it may be that humor is an evolutionary necessity, because if you think backwards very frequently, 5% of the time you're a genius to everybody else. The other 95% of the time you're kind of irritating. And Absolutely. does benign violation provide us with a way of changing people's or, or advancing a, a, an opposing frame of reference to a group without it seeming a threat to their confirmation bias? That's my interesting question. So in collective decision making, is there a really valuable role for humor, which is it's a form of correction without threat? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, it's so I, yeah, I think the answer is yes, but it's a yes, but. And, and the problem is that creating these benign violations is very difficult to do. And so the world's funniest people um, will argue that you need natural talent to do it. The, the problem with their rationale, of course, is that none of them are like 18 years old and just naturally talented. They're 38 years old, there's 48 years old because it takes a long time to be able to hone this craft. And so I do think that, um, that this sort of evolutionary side of, of, uh, of comedy works, which is that you have this sort of harmless threat. And so when done, when done successfully, you can take something that can be threatening and make it accessible and make it okay and make it enjoyable. The problem is making that benign violation is difficult and challenging. And so there's often a, almost a scientific method, uh, at least an agile method. I like to say that vaudeville was the first lean startup where you're, where you're, you're testing, paying attention, revising, testing, and paying attention. So as long as you can get those intermediate steps, then yes, definitely. A couple of questions from Slido. Um, why is humor so context dependent? E.g. people more likely to laugh if they're already in a good mood or surrounded by other laughing people. Uh, can priming with happy cues make humor more effective? Yeah, so first of all- Alan that, Mitchell. Thank yeah, you, Alan, Alan. Alan's observation is correct. So um, comedy works best when, you're, when other people are around you. And obviously laughter is, um, which is one element of this sort of, positive side of this. So there's a behavioral um, uh, element, which is the laughing, and then there's that positive emotion. So positive emotions are associated with non-threatening situations, right? And so positive emotions already help the benign side of that Venn diagram. And, um, and then also the actual laughter part of it is part of the social element to it. So if you think about it, what laughter really does is it signals that that rustling in the bushes that seems threatening is actually safe. 
And so you don't need language to do that. So that can, um, so animals can do that, babies can do that, and cross-culturally we can do that. But yes, being in a good mood is a great way to, uh, to help facilitate jokes. And so is- uh, one, one, final, one final question, uh, which I think is a great one. Um, I think a lot of problems are only solved obliquely. They're mm -hmm. solved by an oblique intervention. And Joel Bailey here asks, in a brittle period of cultural warfare, with lots of sens uh, sensitive identity politics around, uh, what do organizations need to consider, how do they need to consider using comedy in this context? My own view is we're often taking comedy off the air, for example, an episode of um, Faulty Towers, which was already satirizing something in the old, in the 1970s. Mm. Clearly, I remember watching it live in the 1970s. Had a young person uttered the same statement, it wouldn't have been funny, okay? Yes. And yet, if you have this absolute sort of cult of humorless um, uh, signaling of intensity, does that actually prove an obstacle to solving the problem? Yeah, I think the answer is it's an obstacle, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't try. But, but what happens is that you need this, you need to be especially creative and good during these very difficult times, or you need to be willing for some people to be unhappy with you. And so um, I, I often, what I often say is like, you know, you get these sort of big time American comedians like um, Jerry Seinfeld saying, I'm not gonna play college campuses anymore. The students are too sensitive. I think that's a failure in opportunity. What I look forward to are the young comics who are coming up who are going to take a new approach in order to be able to do this. So the answer is, yes, I think it can be done, but it's even more delicate than ever. And unless you can make sure you can really nail it and do it well, you're better off playing it a little bit safe. So uh, very simply, I mean, if you one of the great things about benign violation theory is it does allow you to say things that under a non-humorous context, you couldn't say. The Economist, okay, I never read The Economist, management trainee age 42, is a way of saying something humorously, which if you said it straight, would be actually slightly odious. And Indeed. I think it's very, very interesting the extent to which we actually, humor is a sense, a portal into our brains of new ideas or new frames. And it has a huge value for that. I've, I'm afraid I've been told I've got a wrap now. I'll be back very shortly. But Peter, all I can say is that is astoundingly useful and we can see recurring patterns from that re-emerging everywhere. Thank you very much indeed. Really Cheers. tremendous. And thanks for getting up so early too. My pleasure.
That was absolutely fantastic. We are now past the halfway point of this Marathon Nudstock Festival today. Um, and very soon we'll be passing over to the USA to start hosting their sections of the day. But before we do that, I'd like to say that in 40 minutes time, the Nudstock side tents will be reopening again. If you didn't manage to make them earlier on, this year we're having eight separate side tents talking about eight different specialisms within behavioral science all hosted by a member of our team at the Ogilvy Consulting Behavioural Science Practice, and they're guaranteed to, be, uh, guaranteed to be a hoot, and there's an option for Q&A as well. It's important to say that there are only a few spaces left in some of the tents. There is a, there's a maximum capacity limit. So if you go to nudstock.co.uk and click on the side tents tab, you can register for the ones that we have remaining. Now, next, I'm delighted to say we have with us Professor Dilip Soman, um, he's truly a professor that doesn't just stay in the ivory tower. He really gets down to where the rubber meets the road. His book, The Behaviourally Informed Organisations, is a must read. Um, and we fully agree that you should try and be one of those. Today, he's talking about sludge, what it is and how you can avoid it. So to introduce the least sludgiest man you'll ever meet, delighted to welcome to the Nudstock stage, Professor Dilip Soman. Thank you, Dan. Uh, delighted to be here. And before I begin, I want to acknowledge a few people that have helped me shape my thinking on sludge. Uh, I'll start with Richard Taylor, who coined the term, Cass Sunstein, who's written a heck of a lot on this topic, uh, and then Kate, Daniel, Melanie Kim, Bing Fang, and Niketna, who have written with me uh, on this topic. And a huge shout out to Rory and the gang at, uh, at Ogilvy. I mean, this has been absolutely stunning uh, to get th the audience that you have here. Uh, the world is flat. We get to avoid London Heathrow. Uh, life is good. So uh, let me jump right in. I'm going to start with the story that happened to me about a year ago. I'll then go back in time, 26 years to give you another example, come back six years ago uh, and we'll talk about the future. Uh, so about a year ago, I fell into what is now well known as a subscription trap. So I had signed up for a book uh, that I purchased and, and accidentally had ended up uh, purchasing a subscription to a newspaper that I didn't really want to read. Uh, now, this has probably happened to most of you. And it happens because had I been paying attention to uh, the book purchase and the papers I signed, I probably would have not fallen into this trap. But we're all human. We, we have limited attention. We are emotional. We are distracted. Uh, and, and sellers often make it easy for people to buy things. Uh, now, that, that in itself isn't bad. Uh, but in my case, uh, it went one step further, which is they accidentally slipped in items into my shopping bag when I wasn't actually intending to purchase them. And it's not a nice thing to do, uh, but it does happen a heck of a lot. Uh, the, the interesting part of my story relates to what happened afterwards when I obviously decided that I wanted to now cancel this subscription. Um, sounds like an easy thing to do, uh, but it actually involved several website visits, unanswered email, phone calls where I repeatedly got tossed from agent to agent. Uh, and all of this took a few weeks, and at the end of which most humans would have given up. Uh, but like the good academic, I pressed on and on and on. Uh, and I eventually learned that in order to cancel my subscription, I needed to hold your breath, mail in a letter, like one of these things with a stamp and everything. Um, so I needed to do that. They needed a wet signature on it. I couldn't just print out a signature uh, and making a request. After a six week processing period, uh, they would then send me a form which I needed to fill in. And then again, hold your breath, fax in. Uh, and at the end of that process, they would apparently uh, deduct uh, some unknown amount for a processing fee and an unknown amount for newspapers already received. Uh, and I looked back at the website. It, it said that you can cancel any time. Uh, and in theory, I guess I could cancel any time. In practice, there were just so many hurdles in the way that the best intention to cancel might never really translate into actual cancellation. Uh, and that's a classic example uh, of what I'm going to call sludge. Now, th this also reminds me of a mail-in rebate promotion that I came across back in 1994. I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago working on my PhD. Uh, back in the days of newspapers, uh, I would actually read newspapers because I had some really interesting examples to draw from. And this was one uh, that I'm thankful I saved because I guess I had the foresight that I would I'd be speaking about it 26 years 
later. Uh, this is an appliance store. So they're selling stuff that is pretty expensive. It's not cheap. And they promise to give you 50% cash back. Uh, and that piqued my interest. I said, let me, let me find out what this actually entails. It says, buy it, use it, and then receive 50% of your cash back in 10 years. Um, and then it goes on to, to explain what you need to do. So it says, at the end of 10 years, you will receive a refund of 50% of your purchase price. There is no catch. Uh, simply send in the official registration form that you would receive at the time of sale, a legible copy of your original receipt, and a proof of identification within 30 days. Now, once you've done that, they will then mail you something called a refund claim form, which you need to save. It's on paper and nothing else. Uh, you save that for nine years. Uh, and at the end of the nine years, within 45 days of the ninth anniversary of the purchase of your appliance, they will then uh, mail you the refund, even if you do not own the appliance. Uh, and I'm sure many of you will also not hesitate to call this sludge. Right? So, so what is the sludge thing that I speak of? Sludge can be defined as frictions in a process that impede end users. They confuse people. They ultimately prevent people from doing things that they believe that they're going to be able to do. Uh, and it, it eventually reduces uh, the consumer's welfare. Uh, and, and if you've been hit by sludge, which I suspect all of you have been, uh, put your favorite example either on the chat box here or on Twitter. I'd love to see uh, what sort of sludge you've been hit by. Right? Now, while my two stories illustrate the basic ideas uh, of, of what sludge is, uh, and for me, they were a minor inconvenience, it actually helped me tell a story today. Uh, for a lot of other people, uh, the consequences of sludge can be devastating. Uh, so in particular, I'm going to think about two, two areas of uh, welfare payments when we often have governments have programs to help low income consumers uh, or healthcare uh, services where the consequences of sludge are, are much higher. So when you think about uh, welfare or, or healthcare, the idea is to reach as many of the intended recipients as possible. Right? And I'm going to illustrate that with a very simple metaphor. So this is going to be sort of the, the so-called reach challenge. So imagine that you run the water system for a metaphorical city, and your job is to get water from the storage tower or the treatment plant into as many houses in the city as you possibly can. And what is going to flow from, from that main pipeline is going to go through that grid of pipelines, uh, and it's going to eventually enter every single house. Some houses might actually get no water uh, because they might be off the grid. So here we've got this new construction on the bottom left. It's off the grid. Uh, but the solution is simple. I mean, all you've got to do here is to add another pipe and extend the pipeline, and you can eventually reach that extra house. Uh, but, but I also worry about other houses that are on the grid, but that still do not get water. Why does that happen? Uh, because perhaps the plumbing is old and corroded, and maybe it looks like this. Uh, pipes are full of sludge. Uh, think, think of sludge as any obstruction to the water flow in a pipeline, anything that prevents water from getting from one end of the pipeline to the other end. Uh, this is a new form of the reach problem. It's a, it's a much more insidious version where we have an illusion that we are reaching everyone. We have an illusion that we are supplying water all across the city, but nothing actually makes it through the choked and leaky pipelines. And this is a big problem. So over a century ago, uh, American psychologist and philosopher William James uh, always said that human behavior is a function of, uh, of the organism uh, and the environment. In, in behaviorally con terms, we call that context. Uh, and, and he was very dramatic when he wrote. He talked about sort of people making decisions, people trying to over overcome hurdles and, and, and um, take action uh, as a walk in a garden or a field that has psychological fences and psychological gates. The presence of gates makes things easy for people. Uh, now, obviously, everybody who's here has heard the term nudge that Richard and Cass um, coined in, in 2008. Uh, if you haven't heard the term nudge, uh, why are you at Nudge Talk? Uh, 
But the concept of a gate really is similar to, uh, to a nudge. Uh, and, and the reason for that is it facilitates decision making. It facilitates action uh, because people follow the path of least resistance. So Richard always says, uh, make things easy and people will do it uh, in, in Lewis systems, open the gates and, and, and people will do it. Uh, so changing defaults or simplifying information or presenting options differently can influence the final choice that people make simply by steering people towards and facilitating those choices. Now, you could think about sludge as the evil cousin of nudge, right? Sludge impedes our ability to get things done by erecting psychological fences. And mind you, these are psychological fences, not real fences, right? Uh, now, also mind you that not all fences are bad. You often want fences for certain reasons. Sometimes we deliberately want to slow people down from making rash decisions. Uh, so think about uh, decision making in the domain of divorce, right? Uh, you don't want divorce, uh, both in marriages or in business partnerships or in other forms of relationships, uh, to, to be too easy. You want some sludge there. Uh, if divorce was as easy as Amazon's one-click shopping button, uh, then I suspect our world would look dramatically different uh, today. Uh, but think about uh, contract negotiation processes, right? We, we often impose cooling off periods so that both parties can proverbially sleep on their decisions, think about their promises, uh, and make sure that they didn't actually do anything that they would later regret uh, in the heat of the moment. Uh, and, and those of you who are on Twitter uh, will have probably read yesterday, a lot of people in this group sharing a news article about Twitter introducing an initiative asking people to confirm that they have read a news article that they're about to share. Uh, and, and that's an example to me of a good friction. It slows things down a little bit. You got to actually open the damn thing and, and read it before you share it. Uh, but it's a good friction to combat fake news. So again, sludge isn't always bad or, or friction isn't always bad, right? Uh, I'm going to present this matrix, uh, which captures the basic essence of, of my argument. Uh, I've got four zones here. This is also uh, similar to some of the ideas that uh, Cass Sunstein writes about in some of his work. Um, in zone one, uh, that's your Thaler and Sunstein uh, uh, zone. It's, it's we nudge to help people, we nudge to make things easy uh, for end users, we nudge for good. Uh, but as we can see in zone two, uh, not, not all instances of making it easy are good. They not, not all of them help consumers. So my newspaper subscription example is, is one of those. Um, these things are also called dark patterns in the web design world, patterns that somehow induce people into making purchases uh, that, or taking actions that they later uh, would regret. Um, also in zone three, we, we spoke about that, uh, some friction can actually be good. It can make people vigilant. It can uh, uh, prompt thoughtfulness. Uh, sludge falls in zone four. It creates impedance and it reduces welfare. Now, getting welfare and healthcare to people that need it the most can definitely benefit from Amazon's one-click shopping button. Uh, we, we don't do that. Uh, we require the poorest people to fill complex forms to access welfare. Uh, these are precisely the kind of people who don't have the time or the energy or the bandwidth to fill these complex forms. Uh, in Canada, for example, and, and even in the UK, we say that we have a healthcare system that is free and inclusive, but we require our patients to take time out from a work day or to travel long distances to get the closest appointment, the next possible appointment. Uh, and again, the poorest are the ones that are least likely to have the bandwidth to afford the time or the money to get the free care that we promise them and that they so desperately need. Uh, here's another example. Uh, the Canada Learning Bond offered low-income Canadians a free $2,000 to educate their children. Yet, uh, only 16%, one six of eligible low-income Canadians claim that money uh, in the first year or so after the program was launched. Uh, maybe there was an awareness problem, uh, but it turns out that awareness was only a small part of the problem. As you can see in these promotional materials, the words free money was splattered all over the posters and, and the brochures, uh, but it wasn't really free. Uh, so to get the money, recipients needed something called an RESP account. This is a specific type of a registered investment account. 
To get that, they needed to go to a government service center. Uh, they also needed a birth certificate for their child, which was another process in of itself. Uh, and um, then they required lots of time and lots of patience. Uh, and again, this was a resource that was scarcest for the people who needed the money the most. Uh, other potential recipients were recent immigrants and they didn't understand uh, either of the two Canadian national languages, English or French, yet others came from proud cultures. They, they had just moved uh, to Canada. Uh, they came from proud cultures that felt embarrassed opening a welfare account at a fancy bank where people dressed in suits and ties would potentially look down uh, and take pity on them. And they just didn't want to do that. Uh, and so even though all of these potential recipients had technically been reached, sludge had created an absolutely new form of impedance. Now, I often hear people say that a welfare program uh, that has a low take up rate was probably not needed because after all, if, if I put money out for people and they didn't take it, maybe I shouldn't have done it in the first place. This is a real preference. Uh, another important byline therefore from this example is the take up of any welfare program is not a good indicator of its need. Uh, and that's because take up is always mediated by sludge, sludge that we as, as policymakers can sometimes not even anticipate. As, as one of my collaborators, Jennifer Robson says, implementation matters at least as much as clever ideas and interesting programs. There, there are three sources of sludge. There are clunky processes. Uh, so the one that I described for the Canada Learning Bond, poor communication, and I don't even want to start there, uh, and processes that create negative emotions like embarrassment uh, and shame. And just because you as a program designer don't feel embarrassed doesn't mean that others do. Empathy is a scarce resource, uh, unfortunately, and we need to do much more to actually help people empathize. The, the Canada Learning Bond is, is just one example. There, there are many others to be found all around us. You just need to look. Uh, so for example, an innovative operations researcher at a fast food restaurant created this ingenious algorithm that could assign frontline workers, the cashiers, the people that flip burgers, uh, to shifts the night before. In other words, just in time. Uh, and the idea was that this saved a lot of money for the restaurant chain. Uh, but of course, this also created sludge for single parents who could not find or could not afford childcare at the last minute. And they just got excluded from this job. Um, an another example is a housing subsidy program that I came across in Latin America. Uh, they found that potential aid recipients lied on the form to claim welfare. Uh, and they actually lied and said that their homes were in better shape than they actually were. Why did they do that? Uh, they, they, you know, they, 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 they forego subsidy dollars, uh, but they did that because the design of the form was such that if you checked no to many of the reasons, it was easy for anyone looking at the form to see that you lived in a poor quality house. And they didn't want the inspector who was gonna come and collect the form to know that. Embarrassment, right? Uh, several years ago, uh, there was a merger of two bureaus within the government here, and I've seen this happen in a number of federal and provincial and municipal governments all across the world. Uh, but I ran into a situation where I needed to get a form that I needed to fill up and submit to get the form that I needed to report my employment status on. So I needed a form to get a form. Uh, and I could go on and on, uh, but I trust that you get the point. Uh, and, and to Rory, I would say that if he ever did a sludge stock instead of a nut stock, my suspicion is it would last a lot more than 12 hours. We could go on and on and on. Right? Um, so, so, so let me sort of wrap up by saying the following. Sludge is insidious because it is difficult to see. Right? And mind you, not all sludge is deliberate. Uh, so I want, to, I want to emphasize not every single instance is, 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 is deliberate. It's a bit like weeds in your garden. Right? You don't actually plant them there, but if you don't look, they take over your backyard and they take over your garden. Uh, it just builds up in our process pipelines. Uh, and unless we monitor and maintain them, uh, it's gonna take over and choke your pipes. One person's sludge might not even seem like a significant inconvenience to another one. As practitioners, it is difficult for us to empathize with the context as well as the cognitive and emotional baggage that our end users bring to any interaction with us. Therefore, we must employ systematic approaches and scorecards to continuously detect and measure sludge. Uh, and those of you who are interested, uh, there's a recent BEAR report on our web pages 
that provides some examples on how this can be done. So sludge is a psychological problem, not a logistical one. Without a deliberate attempt to identify, clean, and prevent sludge in our systems, I, I just worry that we might create an illusion of reach without actually reaching everyone that we think we are reaching. Uh, so I'll pause there and turn it back to Rory uh, for comments and questions. So fantastic question. Thank you very much for that, Dilip. I, I think it's, it's, it's really important to make that point that not all sludge is intentional. It's also, I think, important to make the point that there's some forms of sludge which are a kind of tragedy of the commons. So that having had the same experience as you when subscribing to online publications, I'm now disproportionately reluctant to subscribe to anything. Because if I knew and were promised up front that there was a really easy cancellation mechanism, OK, I would actually subscribe on spec to quite a few more things. But now I'm terrified that essentially seven years from now, I'll realize I've been paying seven pounds a month for some obscure publication. And so that's an interesting case where short term optimization in marketing is at loggerheads with uh, you know, long term desirable behavior. I think and that that's I think evidence of someone someone somewhere is optimizing the wrong thing. There's a fantastic question from Keith Hutchings. Uh, wondering what types of sludge are preventing people from taking action on climate change. Uh, unnoticed choke points. And someone was in contact with me recently talking about um, if you actually look in any depth into the business of solar panels, uh, essentially, unless you're a qualified electrical engineer, you will be completely baffled within about the first 20 minutes. So that's almost a case of linguistic sludge. I'd love to know your comments on that, because so, last so, mile I, sludge, I think, is majorly a problem with environmental behavior. I, I think it is. And I think that's why we sort of think about these three sources of sludge. It's not just about having a simple process, right? But you've got to communicate in the language that the person understands. This Rory is marketing 101, uh, but it's amazing how often people don't think about that. Uh, and, I, and I think the reason they don't think about that is some of the, the ways in which we've gone about collecting market research data to figure out what we think the end user needs to know is very different from what they actually need to know. So you're spot on in terms of the linguistic sludge for solar panels. I tried to install one uh, and God, I have a PhD and I couldn't understand that, right? Or opening, <laughs> opening retirement accounts or, or, or even thinking about some of these RESP things. It's, it's, we just believe that people need more information and more technical details and more specifications. Uh, and, and in fact, we end up with quite the opposite results. So I, I think with environment, we have a lot of issues. There's obviously last mile sludge. Um, th there are bigger challenges, which is oftentimes when we, when we look at conserving things like electricity, for example, right? We don't see the damn thing. Uh, and so if you can actually no. visualize electricity in some way, uh, then I suspect we will reduce some of the sludge. So just even increasing the motivation, uh, because at the end of the day, if even if you have sludge, if people are motivated enough, and as an engineer, my, my metaphor is, you can have a choked pipeline. If you create enough pressure, the water is going to flow through, right? Uh, but we don't. We think about them as separate things. And, and I think to your earlier point, organizations have optimized silos. They haven't optimized the end process. Organizations uh, mm. will think about what they can do and how can I optimize what I do not what I want the customer to do, not what I want the end user to do. And I think that simple mindset uh, change might solve a lot of problems. And so uh, I, I'd say the biggest enemy is us. It's, uh, it's not the people. Uh, it's not the end users who aren't complying. Uh, I just don't think we as society have done a good enough job. I mean, there's a question here, which is, is marketing and advertising a form of sludge? And I will, I will open that up to you. Um, I, I would argue that it's often the marketer within the organization who is the only person looking at the problem from the customer's point of view rather than from the institutional point of view. <coughs> so that we're often decisive in being the only people who can spot sludge in the, in the first place. So um, do you, what would your answer be to that, though? I mean, obviously, my answer does have quite a bit of confirmation bias <laughs> attached to it. So, uh... so, so I'm, I'm with you. I think it, in theory, that's the way it should be. I suspect we might have sort of people that fall in the cusp in the sense that they believe that the rest of their organization can deliver stuff that they promise, but in fact, they can't. And so as marketers, we work on briefs 
that are given to us by the rest of the company. And so if, if we have a policy which says that we'll replace your appliance within a day, uh, we promise that in our communication. Uh, but oftentimes, you know, we need to kind of go dig a little bit deeper and say, what does that actually, you know, what does that actually mean? So, so the newspaper promised me that I could cancel anytime, but they didn't tell me uh, what cancellation actually entailed. And so I think that's the, that's the gap we need to bridge. That is fantastic. Because one final thing, I've got to wrap now because I'm getting frantic messages on screen. One thing all marketers make the mistake of doing is we spend far too much time looking at emphasizing positives and far too little time looking for negatives that we can remove. And that's a kind of instinctive thing. And if we can start by saying, let's remove bottlenecks and sludge before we start adding positives, uh, we'll have improved marketing in a stroke. Dilip, I've got to hand over to Dan. It's always a joy. How someone as nice as you got through the University of Chicago will always remain a mystery to me. But now it's time for me to pass over to Dan for some housekeeping issues. I've, Dilip, I've fixed thank that. you I've very fixed much. That. I've fixed that by going to the University of Toronto right now. And so exactly. as a Canadian, exactly. it balances out. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Rory and Dilip. We're, obviously, we are going to rename the festival Sludgestock for next year. So thank you for that one, for a brand new name. We'll, we'll start a whole new side, side festival. Uh, Rory, I'd love to ask you a couple of questions just while we're finishing off. We've got thinking fast questions or thinking slow, so it's up to you. Um, go on fast, then. Thinking fast. Well, these have been coming in from Twitter all day. It's going to be a choice of the two. Um, so I'll give you, give you a one-word answer for both, if that's OK. Pick your favourite, rather. Uh, Four-day week or five-day week? Uh, Four-day week would increase productivity. System one or system two for your decisions? Um, never allow system two completely to override or silence system one. Chromebook or Apple Mac? Chromebook. Reading box or audio box? Ooh, reading box still. This is an odd one. Mind space or Kate Moss? <laughs> There's no way of answering that without incriminating myself, is there? We can move on. I'll, if you I'll like. say mind space. Yeah, go on. Mind space, mind space. Uh, Richard Thaler or Cass Sunstein? Um, oh, my goodness. Uh, oh, dearie me. Well, Cass is on next, so I mean, he's, that on, he's, on, he's on today. So maybe Cass to say, yeah. is, is... The last thing I wanted him to have a fit of peak. My goodness! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, David Ogilvy or Daniel Kahneman? Ooh. That, 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 come on, that, that, that's unfair. Now. That's, that's unfair. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, we can go past on. that one. Yeah. Working from home or working from the office? Um, there's an equilibrium uh, to be found, and it isn't a hundred percent either way. And finally, business travel or Zoom? Uh, Zoom. One of the things I've discovered is that 90% um, of what makes work stressful is nothing to do with the economically productive part of your work, okay? The things that are stressful in work are things like not being able to find a client's office at nine o'clock in the morning. And I've discovered since working over Zoom, I basically, my working life is that of a not very diligent Victorian clergyman. It's idyllic, to be honest. 90% of the stress has gone because the stress was created by completely extraneous factors to the main work you're supposed to be doing. Fantastic. And final question. Out of today's hours, one to eight of nudge stock, has any speaker changed your mind on anything? Um, quite a few. And I was absolutely fascinated. Um, a, uh, going back earlier, um, I, I was astonished seeing Nick Gruen uh, who is an economist, essentially talking about the, and Dan, that whole question, of, I think they haven't really changed my mind because I was always obsessed with it, but having really strong backup for the resilience versus efficiency trade-off makes me feel a lot better, put it that way. And, and, and actually, Adam changed my mind on a few things, it's worth saying as well. That whole question of, you know, indifference is always worth reminding ourselves about. For those of you who weren't up that early in the morning, um, don't worry, it'll be available later. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rory. I'm delighted now to, to introduce uh, Christopher Graves, the president of the Ogilvy Centre for Babel Science. Uh, I think live from Washington, D.C. right now. Chris should be on the screen now. Hey there. Hi, Rory. How amazing. Hello there. How are you? Dan, what an incredible start. And Sam Tatum kicking off from Oz. This has been amazing so far. 
I've really been glued on several screens. It's, you, you know, it's, it's, it's a real attention problem because you're looking at questions, you're looking at LinkedIn live comments, you're looking at Twitter feeds, and everybody is really digging it. I mean, I think I'll see on every corporate strategist and planner's notebook for Monday will be shit storming. This is huge. So I, I really wanted to give you a quick preview as you hand off to the US. I know everybody's gonna be going into their side tents, but when you come over here, we're gonna be having Cass Sunstein, the coiner of the term Nudge, the co-author with Dick Thaler of Nudge. We're gonna be having Sinan Aral, who wrote the, uh, probably the most cited, most viewed, most shared piece of research in the last couple of years on fake news. And of course, we've got others like Elke Weber and Eric Johnson and Kai Wright. It's just going to be fantastic. It can't wait to get started over And here. a quick, quick defense of marketing here. Uh, it's worth remembering that Nudge was originally going to be called libertarian paternalism. So I think we can say that marketing can have a value in the spread and dispersion of ideas. I can't see libertarian paternalism stock ever having become quite this big. Absolutely. I mean, the marketing side is really just message framing. And whether you're talking about, you know, a prevention or a promotion mindset, which is what I'm going to be talking about when we come back or targeting the personality ethically, it's really key. It's not like a medicine. It's not like we inoculate people and suddenly they understand better behavior. And Rory, you posed the question about danger and risk probability. I mean, LK Weber is huge in decades of risk perception research um, about the role of affect in risk perception, but also in the order of the words you offer people. It can make a big difference. For example, Rory Sutherland might order Everest and drugs. Drugs and Everest. Who knew? <laughs> no, so this is going to be great. We've got, a, I think, Dan, you've got a few little instructions on how people move to the side tents. Is that right? The final thing to say right now is that if you haven't pre-registered for a side tent, they're going to start in nine minutes time. So if you head over to nudgestock.co.uk forward slash side dash tent, you'll be able to find the information of the eight different side tents we had now. Hours one to eight have been an absolute pleasure. We're thrilled to be handing over to Chris in the US to take us through the rest of the marathon festival today. Um, and we'll be right back after the side tents at UK time, half past four, the rest of the world, <laughs> as you know. Thank you so Absolute much. pleasure. I'll be making the odd reappearance as well, I think, later on. Yeah, I might well, change Hawaiian shirt. The reappearance will always be odd. Thank you, Rory. <laughs> exactly. No, just a big tip, by the way. The Hawaiian shirt is actually a psychological solution to the obesity crisis. Because the bigger you are, the better they look. Have you noticed that? Thin people can't carry them off at all. So there you go. You've got a nice little sartorial tip just to end before you go into the tents.